things you own end up owning you. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the podcast. Hope everyone is doing great these days. Today's guest is Georgie Dinkoff, otherwise known as Hated. Georgie is an independent health researcher and owner of Idea Labs. He does a regular podcast with Danny Roddy, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, Georgie and I are both from the motherland, him actually being from Bulgaria. So we had a good time talking about culture and politics and from that perspective. We chat about the metabolism of cancer, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide, how Georgie, uh, how Georgie lets go to stay sane, uh, what he does when he drinks alcohol in order to mitigate the effects. Uh, we also talk about the vitamin D supplementation debate and uh, tons more stuff. Loved having him on the show and uh, I hope you enjoy this one too. exactly (laughs) all right we'll switch back to english for now well yeah man and in case anything bad happens we just go over to russian nobody understands us you know (laughs) we'll start we'll start meddling in the elections you know you and me personally (laughs) this this whole thing about like russia meddling russia meddling the elections now it's china tomorrow somebody else oh yeah it's like uh, it's the really sad part is everybody's buying it, you know, or at least the people that are around me. They're like, oh, my God, we need to, like, take money and give it to, like, this special commission. To I'm like, yeah. you people, like, we just endure a, a full year of lockdown. Yeah. Like, 60% of small businesses are, are basically closed for good. And instead of asking for money to restore your, like, way of life, uh-huh. you're like, oh, no, let's throw more money to, like, this this enemy we've never seen. It's this almost enemy, like the terrorists. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Yeah, man, uh, same thing here. I mean, I don't know how D.C. is because, you know, you guys are at least a little bit closer to, you know, the capital and all that stuff. But, I mean, yeah, I, I'm sometimes I'm shocked because people here are like they're genuinely scared, you know, of like, oh, my God, Russia was meddling, you know, and is meddling and blah, blah, blah. Which, you know, the funny part, I didn't tell you, but before I lived in L.A., I lived in Ohio for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so just, you know, I kind of come to this conclusion that at the end of the day, People are a lot more similar than they are different, and they don't realize it. That's true. Uh, because when I was living in Ohio, um, you know, that was like Obama presidency and all that. And back then, um, it was like, uh, oh, my God, those communist Russians. You know, everybody was scared. You know, like everybody would ask me questions like, so how did you move here? Like, what are you doing here? Like, seriously, you know, the, the, the intelligent people didn't ask me stupid questions, but the dumb ones asked me questions like that, you know, and it was like this fear of Russia, you know, the communist. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, I'm Asian not kidding. I've gotten, yeah. I've gotten questions like that, man. So, wow. you know, but that was back then. And then, so it was like, you know, the feeling that I got was like, man, Ohio, like these like small towns, they're like behind the times. They're not getting it. So I'm like, Okay, let's move out west. Let's see how, you know, California is the the, the place of freedom and, and right, you know, right, right. arts. And I moved out here and it was like at first it was it was like, yeah, everybody's an immigrant, everybody's different. And as soon as Trump but then, you know, fast forward to Trump becomes Trump president. Like, right? <laughs> and now things switched completely. Switched back, yeah. Where yeah, I still yeah. have some friends over there in the Midwest where all of them are like, yeah, Russia, Russia's cool, man. I support Russia. And everybody in California is like, oh, they were meddling those rusty the existential threat. Yeah, like, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So it's just you know, at the end of the day, though, I'm like, guys, you don't even realize it, but you're just saying the same thing. It's just you know, you're getting played in a way. You know, exactly. Your guys in the White House, so suddenly whatever he says is like is acceptable, even though you were afraid of Russia. Uh-huh. But Trump says no, Russia's cool. They're like, oh yeah, if he says it's cool, then it's cool, right? Yeah, it's cool. And it's like <laughs> now, now is the another guy like Obama, or whoever is like said no, this is this is like the not biggest threat to our security. And everybody's like, yeah, if you if you if you believe in Obama, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 but, yeah. So it's it's all group politics. So at the end of the day, it's just a smokescreen while behind the scenes things that really affect your life are being implemented. Yeah. And and like once once they get implemented, people are like, oh my God, uh I don't know, like uh I got fired or like I can't afford my or, uh, my mortgage or like uh I you know it's uh, private schools are really expensive. There's a housing crisis. All of these things were happening throughout mm. these times. Mm. But I guess they're I guess they're too boring or yeah. actually they're too unifying. And I think some people just want to they're, they're gunning for a fight, right? Yep. It's like my guy versus your guy. Yep. If we start talking about unifying things, that's kind of boring. I mean, I've talked to both sides of the <laughs> app. Yeah, exactly. and They're like, yeah, I don't want to talk about budget <laughs> yeah. and fixing problems. It's like, this is... 
this you sound like some kind of I don't know like a like a bookworm or something, right? I'm like, yeah. I mean, maybe I am, but you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, that's what that's what affects your life a lot more than some enemy you've never seen. <laughs> yeah, and just like you said, and things are happening, people are not realizing. And I don't know if you visited. Have you gone back to Bulgaria or or you? you know, I, yeah, I try to go every year, but now it's all locked down. So same thing. I have so a, me too. You know, so you know, yeah. but but for me, every year I go. Up until when Trump became president, you know, like the average American doesn't know that. But if you're an American and you go to Russia and you go to like, a, you know, the city, I mean, obviously, if you go to some small town, God knows what will happen to you. But <laughs> <laughs> but if you go to the big cities, I mean, Russians just in general are always so welcoming of Americans. They think it's cool. All of yeah. them are like, oh, my God, you live in California. Oh, my God. You know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever, you know, right, they right. love it. Whereas and then the whole time that Obama was president, it was like the complete opposite here. Remember, because he was so harsh on Russia. He was oh, like, yeah, yeah. He yeah. was like, oh, Russia, the, you know, ter- they don't produce anything, blah, blah, blah. This is, you know, what you said. And uh, but then, yeah, but then Trump became president. And then now, of course, that's also spreading in Russia, too, which is just like shows, you, you know, man, it's just like, you know. It, p- people are getting played here and now even overseas too. And there too now, yeah. you, now you do yeah. have a lot of Russians which are like, you know, fuck off, you know, like get out of here with your stupid politics and all that stuff. You know? Yeah, leave us alone. Like we thought you're cooler, but like it turns out that, you know, that a lot of this was just smokescreen, right? I mean, mm-hmm. like it turns out you're people like us. Uh, so we're like, we want to maintain the vision of America as this beacon, right? Don't ruin it. Right. <laughs> Don't ruin it for us. <laughs> yeah, it's the, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I wanted to talk to you about it. You know, I'm like, Cause it's interesting, you know, like America is still a young country and I don't know what it is. Um, I, you know, cause for example, if you compare America to Russia, Russia's history, like there's this like little joke, I, a meme I saw one time, it was like Russian history explained in one sentence and the sentence is, and then it got worse, you know, like, that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that's what it is. And I think because of that though, because people have been played because people have been fucked over so many times. A lot of Russians, you know, because most of my friends, you know, they're like they're cynical. Come, they're probably cynical, yeah, right? or or they just completely ignore that stuff. You know, they're like, yep. yeah, Putin won the election. Like they're not dumb. They know it's like right, the right. election, and right, right, right. But, but but what are you gonna do about it? Like what they're supposed to go and you know, I, I don't know, just destroy their own lives and their own, you know. So they just live on and kind of ignore things. Whereas here, it's like it's sort of a new thing I think that's happening. Maybe some people are picking up on and other people are just completely shoving it off, right? Because it's like either, you know- It's either, driving me insane, right? You yeah. either, if you accept it, but you can't change it, mm-hmm. then basically like it creates this uh, really bad internal conflict because you're like, oh my God, like I'm getting I'm getting lied to by all these politicians that I elected, right? Mm-hmm. And basically I've been taught throughout high school and primary school and college that, that we have this greatest the greatest system in the free world and mm-hmm. everything work, you know happens for a reason. And mm-hmm. now it turns out there are these forces at play and they're not that much different than than what we've been told is happening in Russia or, or other totalitarian countries. So mm-hmm. half the people are angry and like trying to somehow fight it or rationalize it. The ones that are a little bit older, I would say that have basically been through the Cold War, or even older than that, they're like, mm-hmm. no, that's just how the world works. That's just how <laughs> it goes. Yeah, accepted it and moved on and try to like get on with our lives without. With, yeah. I mean, you still try to change things whenever you get a chance, but you're not going to risk your livelihood or even your life for like some right. stupid stuff that's basically being presented to you by the political elite. It's, there's always been a political elite, and probably always will be. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of like part of the wisdom that all the people have is like, listen. Okay, the the duty of the young is to change the world, but it's basically there's only so much you can do, right? I mean, there are powers that are right. You know, if you can't do anything at all, you know, if you think, if you even believe, you know, that you as one small person can can do something so grand. I mean, people just have these ideas, you know, and like you said, and I mean, that's the cool thing about America is that you have. You know, you can if you have a good idea and you want to fucking conquer the world and probably fuck some people over along the way, you can yeah. probably do it. Whereas in other countries, you can't. But but that is also the problem because then you start thinking like, oh, if I can do this, you know, if I can start Apple, then I can just do this and I can create this and I, we can change the world, man. And yeah, you become a little bit delusional and delusional, also like with yeah. this power, like eventually, I think that uh, what's that statement from Yoda from Star Wars? Ultimate power corrupts ultimate or something. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's basically like. Once you reach, once you cross a certain threshold of power, it's just a, I, I don't know. I don't think it's just a temptation because some people do start as good people, but it's just the dynamics of a massive power structure. Eventually, you just cannot fight fight that thing that you yourself created. Mm-hmm. It's be, it becomes bigger than you, and eventually, you start serving it instead of steering it. Yeah. And I think at that point, it becomes a structure of evil because I don't know. In my opinion, large structures that are unilaterally controlled eventually uh, tend to yep. either collapse or like start serving the dark side. Yep. Yeah. 
And I think that's why people in Russia or countries like Mexico to Mexicans, I find, you know, I live in LA, so I know a lot of Mexican people here and I find a huge similarity. You know, I, I always can feel like I can chat with them a lot more openly about this stuff and they totally get my vibe and they know, and I know what they're saying too. And it's because right. the same history, right? It's like, they've been fucked over. Government has lied to them over and over again. Yep. And, but yep. Hey, what are you going to do? Change the world in, in one day? No. So you just keep living on, do the best you can, you know, and. Organized at a local level, which what yeah. Ray has been saying for a while, you know, like, and I think that's what Russians have been doing ever, ever since the, the, like the beginning of the Cold War. You know, you cannot crush the system because it's so much bigger than you and so much stronger. Uh -huh. So what, what did they, what did they do? They started doing some is that, right? Yeah. And like, and, and like basically gathering small amount of neighbors. Uh, you don't want to make it too big of a group because it starts drawing attention, right? No, no, um, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it become more, much more easy to infiltrate because it's like if you have a hundred people and you know only ten of them, the other ninety, for all you know, could be like agents, right? Mm -hmm. um, and even with a small group, there's still a risk of, of getting compromised. But it's like if you have a sufficient number, large number of small groups, that's very difficult for the system to in, both infiltrate and coordinate continuously mm -hmm. the compromise of all these groups. If it's a few large groups. Then it's easy, right? Yeah. Um, the 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 systems know knows how to compromise. So that's what I I mean. I think certain countries have realized that, and basically people there are like, look, take care of your own family, make sh make sure you're healthy, protect you like the the the, the ones that are closest to you. Don't be a cynic. Uh, don't be 100 percent cynic. I mean, things can change, but they usually mm -hmm. change unexpectedly. Yeah. So it's like what you can do is work towards the change, but don't expect your plans to pan out the way you like you, yeah. you thought they're gonna pan out. You're just trying to move the system in a certain direction. Whether it's gonna follow the path that you want it or not, probably not. Yeah. But yeah. your your efforts matter, but they're not gonna necessarily like things are not gonna necessarily play out the way you want them. But you can still make a you know a change. Yeah, and things take time too. Yeah, things take time. Mm -hmm. It's like you can't do it in in one day, maybe even one year, maybe even ten fucking years. You know, and yeah. God knows. I mean, the only thing is the other thing. The problem with that though too is that people don't realize that sometimes they don't even know what they want. You know what I'm saying? They think that they want this, then ten years go by, and they're like, oh my god, I, I don't know why I wanted that. You know, or maybe it's kind of different now. With things that I wanted. So take your time. Did slow you, down, did you everybody. See the, uh, uh. the surveys about the Iraqi war. No, no. Um, basically, like they asked, like at the time Bush was pushing the Iraq War, they they basically surveyed the public in like ninety two percent or something, and, and the surveys were on both political sides, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe they're faked or not, but like I, I would tend to agree because most people that I talk to, I'm like, no, Iraq needs to go. I mean, the Saddam needs to go. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even if Bush is lying about the WMDs, like this guy needs to go. He's a bad guy, right? Mm -hmm. So so the vast majority of the American public public supported the Iraqi War. And then, like, there was a study done by the Pew Group of Internet Research. They're fairly respectable. Uh, and, and they did it 15 years later. They basically, like, did the exact same survey with all these people that they, used, that they interviewed at the time. Mm -hmm. And all these people almost universally said that they were against the Iraq War at the time. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. you go. Pew <laughs> showed them, this, like, their own responses because some of them were, like, very verbose. And people, like, refused to believe that that's their worst. They're like, no. You're faking it. That's not me. I right. I, I, I would have never <laughs> supported the of Iraqi course. war. And and the, the the study was basically they said like how can you expect people to to tell the truth when they're willing to lie to themselves, right? Yes. So it's yes. like if they're willing to do this to themselves, then basically like the, don't take so seriously. The, the good part is don't take so seriously what people are telling you because it's probably just a fleeting just a fleeting emotion, and yeah, then nobody feeling, will remember. Yeah, yeah man, <laughs> what I they totally agree with you on that. Yeah, that's I think that's really the key in life. Honestly, I mean, it's just don't take it so seriously. Jesus Christ, I mean. I mean, yeah. like you said, of course, it's not about being completely like, you know, uh, oblivious to everything. And but it's just like you said, finding that middle ground. I don't know. Things it takes time, you know, man. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the movie Tri Triple X with uh, Vin Diesel? Of course. It's like this it's a classic action movie. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it's like I like it. I like it a lot. And there's this the scene when he meets with the Russians in Prague. Right. 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 And, By and, the way, the and worst talking Russian about it with Yorgi, ever. <laughs> with Yorgi and, and basically like uh, Yorgi, like uh, they were saying some things and then he realized that they're into like extreme sports as well. Yeah. And yeah, he yeah. taps Yorgi on the shoulder and says, you're all right, Yorgi. And Yorgi's like, everything is all right with enough vodka. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And see, so that's, that's, key that's what I think I a lot miss. of Russians have adopted, yes. and Bulgarians have yes. adopted that attitude. And just Soviet blocking, that, that's what I miss a lot, you know, but I still have friends and I go back often, but I miss that sometimes when I'm here. Just that, just that uh, common sense, just that kind of like, because you don't get that a lot. Americans are yeah. either tend to be extreme. It's like, you know, they're, they're tend Somehow to Somehow detached from reality. I don't know yeah. how to explain it. It's like they're either too delusional or like yeah. too strong, too worked up against, like uh, yeah. about some little things. There's no this thing like you go to Russia, they say, wipe him. 
and you go and you basically, <laughs> Which makes the drink and it's like you have fun, like right? And it's like, yeah, forget about all, look, life is serious enough. Yeah. Let's talk about like more interesting and, and productive things. Right, uh, right. While here, no matter who I talk to, eventually on any political side, eventually the conversation always always comes down to, are you on my side or not? Yeah, and I'm like, or, or my on. other, my one of my fucking things that I hate if people say is, let's agree to disagree. And I get what you're saying, but like, but you know, you're not really saying that. You, We both exactly. know that you're actually saying, I completely disagree with you and i don't exactly. want to agree with I, you at I, all. I might as well hear you say it and then <laughs> yes. we'll move on instead yes. of like we agree to disagree it's such a like a such an appeasement like thing it's like yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. like the <laughs> bullshit political politically correct speech like i'm like look dude it's okay that we have different <laughs> views but somehow it, it's not okay for them right and instead of drinking and making peace yeah, like yeah. the russians do or yeah. the bulgarians do they'll be like they'll continue this like animosity behind the scenes but officially let's agree to disagree right yeah. all it means is let's delay the battle until I find a way to really nail you. That's really yeah, what it comes down. Yeah, and say, yeah, and kind of, it's kind of a power, power pool too. It's like, yeah, say pool. what I want you to say, you know, just say it, yeah, just exactly. say it, you yeah. know? And it's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't want to say that. I just, <laughs> let's just disagree, it's that's like, it. We're too serious about these things. Don't, like, I came out to have fun. I didn't come out to like argue yeah. vociferously about politics. Yeah. But I mean, I understand why people are upset. Their lives have, uh, a lot of people's lives have not improved over the last 20 years. Of course. So they're like, they're looking for a scapegoat and, you know the person standing in front of them. Mm -hmm. That's one scapegoat. It's the most convenient one. Who are they gonna? Who are gonna attack the president? No. Yeah. I mean, you usually attack the person right next to you if if you dislike them for some reason. Yeah, I don't. It's a little different. Like in Russia, Bulgaria, you know, it's all. I think like if somebody is like, oh, it's fucking Putin's fault or something. I think people kind of look at you like. Is it really though? I mean, or is it maybe you, you know what I mean? Like, is it it's really, one guy who's like responsible yeah, for all like, the evils? Like, you know, like he's busy. Like, I know he's yeah. busy, you know, but like, I don't know. Or like the current thing happening with, uh, you know, Navalny. Have you heard about that guy? Yeah, poisoned? yeah. The, the dissident who got poisoned went to Germany for treatment. Yeah, you know, I'm in the middle of that. Rest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, Americans are are all like, he, yeah, of course, Putin, like P Putin personally flew to his hotel room and poisoned him, you know, and it's like. Exactly. Because Putin was a KGB agent and those habits, die, they die hard. Yes. The guy's probably still an assassin and he, he decorates his torture chamber at home yes. and waits for With these dissidents skulls. to come out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, because I mean, in America, nobody is ever tied to the CIA at all. I mean, oh, there's no, oh, such no thing. not at all. They're all <laughs> upstanding citizens, right? Uh, yeah. the, uh, have you seen this? Like, uh, I think it was actually on CNN. Nancy Pelosi, when like the Hong Kong people were rioting and like destroyed the Hong Kong Parliament and uh, trashed the whole city, right? She's yeah. like, "What upstanding citizens? They're standing up to the tyranny <laughs> of China, right?" And like yeah, similar uh, events, maybe for a different reason, a, a, trans a lot less violent, by the way, because uh -huh. in Hong Kong, people are, like stabbing and shooting each other all the time. Yeah. And here, just like, you know, like you have people crash into parliament or somebody open the gates, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like, and she's like, oh my God, the American democracy has been desecrated. Yeah. This, how can you allow that? I'm like, you just three days ago or three months ago, you said, look at those people sacking their own city. Mm -hmm. They're like the greatest people on the planet. Well, guess what? That's what people do when they're angry. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least mm -hmm. recognize that. Uh, these people that are here and doing the exact same thing, maybe they have a reason. You you may not be you may not think you're the reason for their anger, but I guarantee you they didn't suddenly one day wake up, lose their minds, and said, "Oh, let's storm the Capitol." This has That's been true. going on for a long, long time. It's been bubbling up, and politicians from both sides will be like, "Ah, let's ignore the poor, or let's ignore the regular folks. Let's mm -hmm. make sure we pass our agenda." Well, at some point you're gonna have to like reckon with those people, and uh, once they once they lose their mind, it's very very difficult to reckon with them <laughs> yeah it's small little steps too you know it's small little steps since since been living since i've been living here i've been kind of watching them progress you know and again cuz you know although i have been definitely americanized by this point you know and i i'm you know uh, like I don't think of myself like as a only Russian in America, you know. Like I, I think right, of myself right, right. American half Russian, and half, yeah, half yeah. and half. And there's nothing wrong with that. And that's you know because um, I think America is a state of mind. That's like the easiest way I can explain it to my Bulgarians. Because like, oh, you, you like you went there and you become so Americanized. I'm like, no. If you remember, I had these attitudes. That b yeah. before I went to America, and that's what that's actually what made me kind of dislike the environment in Bulgaria yeah. and want to go to another country. Right. And basically, the reason I went to America is because what I wanted that country at the time was close to offering pretty much everything I wanted. Mm -hmm. So it's like sometimes you know they say like, well, you come to America, you become American. Actually, sometimes it takes an American to come to America. So it's like more of a state of mind yeah. because really it's like a it's an immigrant culture of people dissatisfied with whatever they had back then. Or there, they come over here and try to make a new life. 
I don't think that's like that. That's that's something tied to ethnicity. Nobody's from America. Everybody's an immigrant, right? Yeah. So it's like it's just a, it's just the attitude that if you want something and you want something to improve in your life, you're willing to make the sacrifices and the hard work. Mm-hmm. Then America used at least used to give you the opportunity to do that. There's nothing uniquely. There's nothing uh, uh, American as in like ethnic centric idea about mm-hmm. being an American. It's simply of a person who is willing to improve their lives by shunning mm-hmm. whatever everybody else is telling them and willing to go on their own. So really, I guess America is a setting for individualism, hard work, and willing to be a pioneer. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely a unique place. Yeah, man. And um, and yeah, and we're here, right? So that's what I'm saying. I, I don't, you know, but you, we still have that kind of, uh, you have that a, a little bit more of a pulled back objective view, right? Yeah. Of things just because you've seen things happen on the other side of that. And you're like, oh, okay, I get it. Or I don't get it. Whereas people that were you not know, born and raised here, you know, people that are in the middle of the country, just like, you know, I don't know, Kansas or whatever, not to pick on Kansas, but I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, yeah they have raised. their own thing and they've never seen anything else. They've yeah. never left the state. Some of them have never left the state. Yeah, and also America is so fucking big that, you know, and yeah. above you have Canada, which is like, come on, you're going to tell me that's like a really a different country. Like, it's the same fucking thing. It's exactly. Yeah. The, like every single thing, including the electrical outlets, the cars that they drive. <laughs> yeah. So like, the language, the only difference is like, okay, part of the country speaks French, right? Yeah, but right? that part is like That's this it. big. Man. I know, I know. <laughs> and they want to secede. So it's like if you remove Quebec from Canada, yeah. it's another another state of the United States. Yeah, and, and I actually will tell you because I have a friend here that has a, a gym down in Huntington Beach. Shout out to uh, Kilo Strength. Um, he's from Quebec, yeah. And, and okay. yeah, they do have their own vibe, you know? I mean, they're like French, Canadian, you know, people from Quebec and – they're, you know, they do feel a lot different than the normal Canadians, kind of, you yeah. know, and, you know. Didn't they, did they have three referendums, like for independence or something, over the last I'm 20 sure, years? Man. But I know they tried to become their own yeah. thing. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I know. I don't know how many, but I know that they, they would love that probably, most of them. <laughs> France would love it, but it's like, I think <laughs> yeah. at some point it's just, it's just a, lot, a lot more talk than action because, okay, Quebec secedes. I mean, again, you actually have a lot to lose from seceding, uh, from seceding from Canada. Mm-hmm. You're here ge- geographically. What are you going to do? Become an enclave of France, yeah. like from across the ocean? That doesn't usually work out that well. And besides, when I've actually spoken to people who are from France and from Quebec, mm-hmm. they don't particularly like each other. <laughs> no. Oh, oh, French. Sorry, Frenchies, but to pick on you, but dude, Frenchies are the weirdest people, you know? Whereas, like, I feel like Russians or, you know, Ukrainians, Bulgarians, whatever, like, we have that language tie. It's kind of like, oh, hey, you know, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, of course, there's some, you know, inner, I'm, I'm sure some somebody hates somebody, like Ukrainians, some some of the Western Ukrainians, for example, are not really defensive Russians. Russians. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. with French people, it's the weirdest fucking people in the world. Because, so you have the French, right, France, and they think the Belgians sound like retarded. They, they think yeah. that they sound yeah. so silly and they make fun of them. Then you have the Swiss, which make fun of the Belgians. And, <laughs> and, and, and the French don't like the Swiss either. And then you have the Quebecans, which are like completely different, and they just hate everybody. And it's anybody just, else? Yeah. It's a very yeah. particular thing with with the French language. I don't know why. With Spanish, it's it? not like that, you know. <laughs> what was the expression? America and UK, two countries divided by a common language. So the same thing applies to all these countries as well. Like, mm-hmm. but it's not two; it's twenty countries divided by a common language. <laughs> because if you talk to some of the former French colonies. They don't particularly like the French. The yeah. French don't like them either. Mostly because the colonies said, oh, you know what? We're going to be independent, so we're not going to no longer <laughs> give you money for free. So I understand why the French are upset. Yeah. But the colonies now, okay, the French were, you know, maybe did some bad things, but not all colonies had it bad during French colonization. Uh, some of them got really modernized because of the French presence, right? Mm-hmm. But now, like, when they're independent... There is a very strong anti-French sentiment in most former French colonies. So strange. Um, I find it so, yeah, it's like, so unique to, to that language, though. Like, but they like, kept the language. But they kept the language. And I'm like, so that's, like, <laughs> that's, that's what ridiculous. I'm saying. Yeah, drop the language. Go back to your native, usually African colonies. Like, yeah. Go back to your native language, whatever it was. I mean, like, you keep the French language, which makes you a... Uh, kind of naturally allows allow uh, aligns you with French interests yeah. and French politics, but suddenly like no, we, we don't want ha- we don't want anything to do with them. Yeah, but you're still doing business with them. You're yeah. still using their language. Um, your your entire educational system is based on the French one. Mm. I'm like, so you can't have it both ways. I mean, 
you might as well say, okay, we don't like the French as a country, but a lot of good things that they have in their system, yeah. and we decided to adopt those. No, you don't hear that either. Very They're just un- uh, very unique complaining. thing. Yeah, very. Yeah. Un- you know, you have like South America. Everybody speaks Spanish, but they're all you know, but they're all kind of seem to be get along. I think, right? I mean, of course, I don't know all the inner place because I'm not Spanish speaker native, but yeah, man, it's a unique thing to the French language. I find it so yeah, funny. They, that. I think that whoever speaks French language in a particular part of the world think they are like kind of like the the true heirs. The true heirs of the French monarchy, right? And everybody else is oh, a player. Yeah, maybe that has, <laughs> some, that has something to do with it. Yeah, man. Yeah. So I don't know. So what do you think, like, in the future? Do you think in, in 100 years, Americans, you know, or USA, if it still is USA or whatever, do you think they'll have similar views, you know, like the sort of things that we we're talking about, like where, you know, Russians have been, like, oh, been there, done that, like, you know, 19, 1913 revolution or whatever, you know, it's like, we've been through this, like, we know what's going to happen. And, you know, do you think people... Well, it's already happening. I think yeah. it's already happening. Most of, people of the people that I went that? to, yeah, most of the people that I went to college with, they were Americans. I mean, I still keep in touch with some of them. And uh, like the change in attitude was was dramatic. I still remember when I was in 2001, I was still in college. I went to Georgetown, which is here in D.C. Mm-hmm. And basically, like, uh, I was arguing with all of my classmates because I, I took one look and I thought, like, oh, my God, what a false flag. Or, like, or at least there's something <laughs> deeply suspicious mm-hmm. about this whole procedure. And I thought even if that was real, the whole thing about Iraq war and, like, the Middle East war, it's all about oil and money and guns and whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And I got, like, destroyed by all my classmates saying, like, how can you say that? Mm. Don't you see how great America is? We're actually spreading freedom, spreading democracy to all these countries. I'm like, my God, what, yeah. what kind of lunatics are you? Like, you, you – and, and then I get it. You've never left the country. Like, yeah. have you been to Afghanistan? Like, you know, certain parts no. of the country, no. they don't want to – they don't tolerate any political regime that doesn't promise them regular beheadings at noon on, TV, on national TV. Mm-hmm. And, like – they don't care about your democracy. They actually hate it, right? Well, yeah. The, the, another problem you bring up is leaving the country thing. I have a problem with that sometimes with people when they say like, oh, I've been to Europe. And like, you know, they take like a week-long vacation in like Rome or something. You know, right, they go right, to like right, the right. – and right. there's like McDonald's across the street. That's right. And, Subway. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just some America, you know, where, yeah, it's like you haven't really, really traveled. You know, you got to like really travel. You got to go to some shitty places to understand. But also make sure you appreciate the good places too, you know. And so, so yeah. you think it's already happening where people are adopting a different kind of view because yeah, like well, you said, I moved here early two thousands too, and and it was like yeah, I, I didn't. Not a lot of people were saying that. It was very much you know, we'll fix this, we'll get it done, and woohoo, hoorah. I mean, it's just twenty years of promises and nothing happening, and basically now with the internet, where basically every promise of a politician is kind of broadcasted in real time to the entire country. I think it's kind of show is, is led to a fatigue. First, it led to a fatigue in believing in promises. Then, basically, uh, after two recessions, uh, the 2008, actually three, the dot com crash in 2001, um, and then it was the, uh, the the like the the Great Recession, as they call it, which was really a depression, but you can't use that word because yeah, right. it's not politically correct. <laughs> so, 2008 crash, and then now the the, the whole like thing with regards to the lockdowns and the pandemic. So, three recessions. I, I think the millennial generation will probably be, it already is the most cynical generation in American history. The only, with well, the only possible exception being the generation of Ray P, which is known as the silent generation, because they grew up during McCarthyism, and basically, like uh, they they learned that the secret police in the United States can come and get you uh, on trumped up charges, like oh you're a communist or you're a communist sy- uh, sympathizer, even yeah. though it wasn't illegal, right? Mm-hmm. So they knew that, that the state can do whatever the heck it wants with you, so they kept their mouth shut. For whatever reason, the experience of that generation went away, or maybe people got tired of, of the oppression, and that led to the uh, generation of that, you know, the, basically the hippies and the civil rights movement of the 60s, right? Yeah. Um, so it's like kind of like it goes, I guess, I guess it goes back and forth. Like it's, there's some realization that reality sucks, right? So mm-hmm. there's a generation kind of kind of like, you know, basically like, uh, so it's like, okay, we're going to just, you know, buckle up and we're going to get through this. It won't be easy. But, but, you know, they don't want that same life to be transferred onto their children. So they try to raise children and give them a better life, which is admirable, but at the same time creates a little bit of a delusion, right? The children grow up to be nothing like their parents. They, they're like, oh, your life as parents sucked. I don't want that, right? You gave uh-huh. me a better life. But at the same time, that removes you from what reality really is. It's neither completely terrible nor completely blissful, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And it's like it seems that each generation kind of swings back and forth between these two because that's that the life that they endured – they don't want that life for the next generation. If you endure a delusional life and you crash, you're probably going to raise your children to be very, very cautious. In mm-hmm. other words, they will be the next silent generation. 
but that it's tiring and it's taxing on, on, on the human consciousness. So well, after a generation lives for a few decades, they're like, uh, you know, and maybe the evil is, has already been defeated or transferred to something else. They're like, okay, we need to relax a little because life starts to really suck, right? And then their children basically were like, uh, you know, uh, we've had some difficulties over a few decades. So let's make sure that our children have a better life. So it's back and forth, back and forth. And hopefully this leads to some progress. I mean, you can see that there is progress in, in human knowledge, but at every junction in time, there, there always a, there's always a, like a dark force in hiding waiting to usurp the power because really the human beings, what they do with their life is creating power, right? It can be used for both good and bad. And I think that's what was really happening. It's like the, 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 the fruits of the human creation are periodically usurped by either good or bad forces. And that's why we see this uh, change in attitude between the different generations. But I think America has never had a, a generation as cynical as the millennials. I mean, most of them, the vast majority will be drastically poorer than their parents. Um, yeah. They have no hope of retiring with a, uh, in, in a traditional manner, which is like they have a 401k or have they, they have a house that they've, been, they've already paid off, right? So they can do reverse mortgage. So basically they're looking at working until they die. And it's really, and also like the working conditions have become much more, much harder for many people doing the regular corporate job. So mm -hmm. it's no longer nine to five. You now you have this phone, you know, your boss is emailing at like 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning, right? And it's like, <laughs> and you feel this urge, like you're always on, right? So this attitude, yeah, I mean, it's very, very exhausting. So I think that's leading to like a fatigue and also uh, cynicism because they're like, you know what? All these promises about like voting politicians, they're going to change our lives. That's all bullshit. Now, I don't think that's entirely true. I think there's a good truth to that. And I'm actually kind of glad that the American generation is waking up and saying, uh, look, uh, even a great country like America can sometimes do evil things. Mm -hmm. And even voting for the good politicians doesn't guarantee a good outcome. Mm -hmm. So it's like that's kind of, that kind of realism, I think, was sorely lacking in America. And now it's starting to take hold. I yeah. think that's a that's a good change. Yeah. Um, now, of course, it, if it turns into a complete nihilism, that's not good because nobody will be willing to do anything. They'll just do. And uh, unfortunately, a good portion of the population is starting to experience that because you've seen the opioid crisis, you see the drug addictions, the suicides, and whatnot. They're to the they're the highest they've ever been. So that tells you a portion of the public is basically losing hope and saying, "Screw it." I mean, if this life is meaningless, I'm just going to shoot drugs or do whatever, and I don't care about anything. Um, their psychological research shows that if that proportion of the population crosses 15%, you're looking at a total societal collapse. Mm -hmm. It's just too much for society to bear because at 15%, this means every family will have like a loved one who is either destroying their lives on purpose by doing drugs or something else or, you know, doing crime or whatnot, or in the process of already committing suicide. I mean, that really destroys a family. And it's like, so right now we're at, Nine percent. So we have six more, six more percent to go. So if things don't improve, then we may see a societal collapse. We'll see how it goes, man. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. We'll yeah, see, we'll see. I, but... I, I'm not pessimistic. I'm trying to be realistic. No, I know. I mean, I know. We're in a tough yeah. situation, right? Yeah. And I, I keep telling the nihilist, I'm like, listen, the reason you need to be non -nihil nihilist is because nobody has full control of reality, right? Mm -hmm. As bad as it seems, nobody fully controls it all. And I, to the optimist, they say, you need to get out of your bubble because people around you are dying. And you cannot sit here and tell me that, oh, if you only vote for the right people, things will kind of change for the better. Actually, the change starts, starts with you, like to quote Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world. Um, we'll see. But, you know, now they're both forces are kind of like, uh, let, you know, battling for uh, for dominance. Yeah. Um, and um, again, I, I think the millennial generation will be the most realistic of all uh, American generations of, yeah. uh, up until now, um, while also potentially having a good proportion of that generation become, I don't know, nihilistic or whatever, like or too or too pessimistic. Yeah. But, but guess what? Being completely delusional was, uh, as you see, led to very bad outcomes. Yeah. To yep. complete com complete manipulation of society by by corrupt politicians, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, at some point, that bubble has to burst. You know, that's right. that's the Eastern European mentality. It's like uh, all good things. Uh, either come to an end or you need to realize that they, they come in, in successions. You have some good things, you have some bad things, you have some good things, you have some bad things. This attitude of like it's going to be totally good forever or totally bad forever, 
none of that really seems to match reality. No, no. But it's been and it's been small steps. Yeah, small steps. I had a conversation about similar stuff with a friend, and yeah, and it was like, you know, he was sort of like, "Oh my God, like where did this come from?" You know, and like you said, <laughs> I've been sort of watching it happen, and I think a lot of other people have been too. It's just because it, t- it takes time. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. Where like you said, people just freak out and go storm the Capitol. It's been, you know, years and years and years, and it's been slowly accumulating. And I think, yep. um, yeah, it probably has been kind of the biggest kind of event. I think right since. I mean, maybe maybe since ever in America, huh? Because you know. Yeah, ever. I mean, I don't think it, well in the in the modern history. In the I mean, modern I'm sure, history, like back in yeah. the eighteen and seventeen hundreds, people yeah. were shooting each other <laughs> in the bars, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, but there isn't much recorded history from that from that part of the like the the, the country's history, right? Yes. Uh, I, I guess those people would be like the most realistic, right? Yeah. They're like <laughs> hardcore. You wake up in the morning and you don't know if you're going to come back alive at home, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like about as realistic as it gets. So that's I don't think real. we need that level of realism. That's just, that's jungle law, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, <laughs> so, but as, as you build civilization, you never really leave the jungle fully behind. I think that's, that, that should be the message for everybody. As, you, as you're working from the darkness towards light, the darkness never fully leaves. It just dwindles. But you need to always be aware that it's there and it can always come back if you're not paying attention. Love it. That's a that's a quotable thing right there, man. <laughs> Love it. So, what can people do? I mean, these days, you know, in order to, to keep themselves sane, to keep themselves from you know fucking going bonkers and in, uh, in these hard times. Can- I think the. I mean, one of the. So, I mean, if you uh, there's some studies on prisoners of war in Vietnam, um, and they basically like uh, they uh, they interrogated and they found out what things they were doing while they were uh, they were basically in uh, in Vietnam in the camps. And um, apparently, as bad as it sounds, starting like having fantasies about escapes and like living in dreamland and all this kind of thing. So this delusion that we that we accuse a lot of people of having, that's a coping mechanism, right? Mm. I mean, they're basically like they're saying, like, I can't deal with the reality if it's too harsh for me. And it's different harshness for everybody because not everybody has the same resources of coping, right? If you're in, a, in good me- metabolism, you have financial resources, you have a big social network. Uh, mm. You're probably not going to care much, like basically, if the if the country is collapsing, right? I mean, as long as it doesn't affect you that much directly. If you have like a massive student loan and you've been laid off, like for the last th- from the last three jobs, you just moved in back with your parents. Mm-hmm. Guess what? It's hard <laughs> to convince that life is all shits and giggles. <laughs> yeah. So physical exercise was found to to help a lot, um, but above all was things basically p- uh, people doing things that basically um, uh, fantasizing about escape. Um, and also working towards escape, even if it was something that wasn't necessarily uh, realistically le- going, going to lead to escape, such as, oh, I'm going to dig a hole under like under the wall, right? Uh-huh. So they start making these little holes, and then they watch if the guards are going to notice that, that they're digging, right? And if they're not, they feel like this has been success. I'm starting to outsmart the guards. And they do these little things, but basically it was all about keeping themselves sane, just like you said. So it's like doing things that... That that uh, even if, even if they're not realistic, going to lead to a change, at least are within the framework, such as subverting whatever system you think is compromising your life, right? Um, or doing things that you above all was doing things that were that you were good at. Now, uh, the people that did the best in the in the labor camps were people who were like artists, especially musicians, and they were basically given an instrument and allowed to play it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, some people say, oh, that's because they made friends with the guards and the guards start, start doing them favors, right, in return for the music. Nah. Some of that is true, uh-huh. but I think a lot of that was people actually, that, that replaced freedom for them because mm-hmm. that's the one activity you could still do where nobody was interfering with, right? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. everything else, eating, sleeping, <clears throat> going to the bathroom, exercising, all of this was constantly monitored mm-hmm. and constantly controlled by the guards. Well, the one thing that wasn't is like you exercising your creativity and mind. Yeah. And of course, that sometimes led to good outcome. Like the guy's like, oh my, this guy's really good. We're going to give him like some extra food or we're not going to torture him as much as the others, right? Uh-huh. Um, so that I'm sure had benefits, but the psychological study said that it has been noticed in other situations such as isolation, like you're in solitary confinement in prison. The ones that do the best are uh, the, were the ones who are basically like didn't lose their minds were people who started drawing on the walls. Or mm-hmm. started singing and composing tunes in their mind, right? Things like mm-hmm. that. So it was basically uh, uh, um, uh, exercising and performing acts of freedom, mm-hmm. you know, during these acts of captivity. So it was it was helping them to break the learn helplessness. In other words, to convince yourself that not everything is lost and you still have control over over life. 
the old uh, soldier playing, a uh, Russian soldier playing a little balalaika, right? On the, exactly. Right on the field of war. I mean, that's a... Right on the <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I don't know if people know, but that's how that instrument kind of became what it is, you know, because people were doing that because it's a small... Americans little... have the exact same thing. It's like a... a, a I, I don't know what they call it, but it's like, it sounds very similar in little the Midwest. U- ukulele, you mean? Little ukulele? Ukulele, yeah. Or yeah, something, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's more it's of a sim- Hawaiian kind of vibe thing, but yeah, man, it's uh, you but know, also a small the guitar you can music. take with you. What'd you say? Yeah, if you listen to bl- bluegrass music, mm-hmm. they have this instrument which is very similar. Oh, it's banjo. Banjo, 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 banjo. Yeah. banjo. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's good stuff. That's the same thing, actually. Yeah, you're right. I think I think it was played right during times of civil war. I don't know. Correct? Of course. Wrong. Yeah. yeah. You you go you going out into into the heartland. It's fine to hard. Uh, it's it's hard to find um, a song that's played on the radio that doesn't have like at least like some some sort of like a banjo kind of uh, sound. And it's like mm-hmm. and some of the saddest songs in country music. Mm-hmm. They're almost invariably played on the banjo. Yep. Like you, if you look at some of the some of the cowboy songs about like you know uh, sinning and redemption and, and you know and killing some Indians and, and stuff like that, mm-hmm. they're all like they're all banjo songs. Mm-hmm. I think it's got mm-hmm. this like this like sad but redeeming sound that it produces. This, it's just something. It's so funny, right? That the best some of the best music that you know everybody kind of agrees this is great music. It's just it's a little. It's not necessarily sad. It's not only sad, right? But it's right. just this. Something about it, right? That it's like we sad but hopeful. Sad, sad but hopeful. hopeful, yeah. Or you know, sad and been there, and I know how you feel. We'll get through it, kind of thing. Whereas if you listen to like you know the current, I don't know, rap artists of today or whatever, it's just like <laughs> it's all shooting each other, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, it's just like it's so funny though, right? And you know, maybe if you're a teenager, you're kind of into that, but then. At, I think almost universally, as you get older, you just start listening to music that's more like that, you know, and it's something about that, which I find so interesting. So, um, yeah. So how, how, what do you do, man? Do you do anything artistic like that? To let, let it out. I know you're a prolific writer and stuff, you know, I mean, is that kind of your way of doing that for yourself? Um, that's part of it. But I think the, the bigger part is that I started doing my own studies with like a research group in Bulgaria. Wow. Um, and, yeah. And I, I'll send you the links. We already published a few uh, with some of the products that I sell. Yeah, please do. And I'll, um, I'll put it in the uh, in description and all that. Yeah, man. Yeah. And also, like, even more important than that, basically, uh, I, I hooked up with some chemists at the uh, University in Sofia, which mm-hmm. is like the capital. Mm-hmm. And now we're starting to synthesize new molecules. Wow. So it's like that, that's the creative part, right? So it's basically you mm-hmm. come up with new things that actually are going to um, – Compete with some of some well not compete but like confirm or reject some of these ideas the metabolic ideas and you know not that I have a hope of curing cancer but I think there's a good chance that we may be able to prove this whole this whole, this whole hypothesis beyond any doubt whether cancer cells love fat or sugar because mm-hmm. still if you go to any doctor um, or talk to anybody in Western medicine they'll be like yeah cancer cells are, are, are addicted to sugar so that's why we need to restrict it limit it right uh, they, but they've tried doing cancer trials cancer trials with sugar inhibiting drugs. Mm-hmm. Like uh, there's this chemical called two deoxy glucose, mm-hmm. which is basically glucose, but it's it's got an extra an extra. Uh, I'm sorry, it's like um, uh, uh, oxygen has been removed from position two, so the body cannot metabolize it, but mm-hmm. it displaces regular glucose. So cancer cells loaded up in this on, on this fake glucose, and the theory was that basically prevents the cancer cell from, from getting the real glucose. So this means the cancer cell will will basically will be somehow killed. Because they're they don't get access to the fuel starved, they need. Starved, right? As they yeah, say. starved yeah. or something. Yes, uh-huh. didn't work. It did not. No, mm-hmm. actually, it backfired. It mm-hmm. made the cancer spread because I guess the cancer was like, oh my god, the environment is getting even worse than, <laughs> than, than I thought it was. So let me send out these soldiers, these sentinels, mm-hmm. like all over the body, and like they're gonna take hold there and create their own little colonies, right? Mm-hmm. And basically, it was a complete failure. Um, and and but now the every every trial that has that has administered a drug that either um, inhibits the absorption of fat, which kind of limits the supply of fat to the tumor, uh, or inhibits the synthesis of fat, which there's an enzyme called fatty acid synthase, mm-hmm. which is basically highly expressed in every single cancer type. So basically the tumor, if you don't provide a tumor with fat, the tumor will try to synthesize it from sugar and other and other like an amino acids, right? Mm-hmm. But if you block the, the pathway of synthesizing fat, it's been shown that in many cases you can actually make the tumor disappear completely. And mm-hmm. above all, all of these things ultimately lead to the to the cancer wanting to get that fat to oxidize it as fuel because the fat oxidation keeps the cancer in a heavily reduced state, which is really the cancer state. Mm-hmm. So if you block the, the the oxidation of fat, which is the final step, there are multiple pathways, supplying fat, synthesizing fat, and finally it all comes down to oxidizing it because that's what the tumor wants to do. If you block that step, the tumor has no way of overcoming that and basically is forced to switch to metabolizing glucose 
and the glucose supports the oxidative metabolism, which brings oxygen into the cancer cell, mm. and cancer cells cannot thrive under under a high oxygen environment. Um, very old studies were tried where they actually injected oxygen into tumors, mm -hmm. and basically in, in every single case, the tumor the tumor basically like uh, ruptured and disappeared. But unfortunately, when you have a ruptured tumor in the body, there's this thing nasty thing called tumor lysis syndrome. The tumor contains a lot of toxic chemicals inside of it. Many times the animal dies of the toxicity. So it's like, yeah, we already know how to cure cancer, but it's a very high mortality uh, rate. That's why it hasn't been tried in humans. Mm -hmm. Where do you think that that comes from? That idea that sugar, you know, feeds cancer. I mean, was it Otto? Was it Otto Warburg that was the one of the first pioneers, kind of, of those studies? So the, the demonization of sugar, he never blamed sugar. He just right, said... Right, and I was going to say that he yeah. he he was one of the no. first guys to do it, and he actually said the opposite, right? Wasn't it? He said that it was... Was it the lactic acid, or what was it? Yes. Like, I can't, he said acid, cancer right? cells waste the sugar. So we need to find out why cancer cells waste the sugar into lactic acid yeah. instead of metabolizing it like normal cells into carbon dioxide. Right, now and he never got around to prove that, but he said he thought that oxygen deficiency is the actual cause of cancer, and that, hence these trials with animals, but I said they injected actually oxygen into the tumor. It mm -hmm. worked, but it was highly toxic, right? It's basically like it led to almost like a cytokine storm that now is killing these people with COVID, right? Mm -hmm. uh, almost every person who died of viral disease or bacterial disease, ultimately they die for something called multi-organ failure. And that's driven by an overactive immune system and all of these inflammatory mediators, many of them synthesized from PUFA, but it's, it's really like an inflammatory, massive inflammatory reaction. Mm -hmm. And and basically, um, so basically the, the this, this tumor lysis syndrome, when the tumor ruptures, creates this 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 uh, cytokine storm and ultimately multi-organ failure. So that was tried, but we know that the oxygen is a factor, but it's not the only factor because simply providing more oxygen doesn't seem to help. Um, and also when the tumor is in a very reduced environment mm -hmm. inside the cancer cell, even if you supply oxygen through the blood, the oxygen only dissociates from a hemoglobin based on how much carbon dioxide is produced in a particular cell. That's the signal for hemoglobin where it needs to release the oxygen. And since tumors are very low in, on carbon dioxide and high in lactic acid, that oxygen that you pumped into the hemoglobin by making people breathe pure oxygen with right. uh, people with cancer, it's never get it's never going to get released into the tumor. It will just keep circulating around and around and so, be so used. The whole yeah, the whole thing of using the oxygen stuff is just it's it's oh, only, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy, actually right? makes it worse because if you oversaturate the blood with oxygen, mm -hmm. um, basically uh, it's known to raise um, the levels of prolactin and cortisol mm -hmm. uh, and a number of different also serotonin. So it's mm -hmm. like if you breathe too high of an oxygen percentage from the air, that's why the air we breathe is not 100% oxygen. It's mm -hmm. actually it's got a, a decent amount of nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and other gases. Right. But the one the one they give to the hospital to the patient to the patient in the hospital, it's almost always 100% oxygen. It's just oxygen, that's right? Deadly. Yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. pure oxygen. Right. And th that's why there's this product called Carbogen, which mm -hmm. which this guy I think he's Italian realized a long time ago said, look, whenever we try to resuscitate a patient who's been in shock or like it's been in a coma, we notice that if we give them pure oxygen, mm -hmm. they invariably die. Like, so oxygen is actually dangerous by itself. Right. It's only in the combination with carbon dioxide, we actually allow mm -hmm. the cell to safely use the oxygen mm -hmm. without actually getting getting uh, um, uh, like uh, either uh, overloaded with prolactin or cortisol. So, so he's like, so he's like, okay, let's start giving people in hospitals carbogen, but it's more expensive than the regular oxygen. And like for some reason, the oxygen industry didn't like his product. Uh, they actually shoot him, try to uh, try to convince the course that he infringed on some patents. Mm -hmm. So carbogen still exists, mm -hmm. but most hospitals don't have it. You have to ask for it. Then they can order it from like a warehouse or something. Needless to say, if you're in a critical condition, the doctors are not going to tolerate the relative saying like, no, we don't want him him or her put in oxygen. We need carbogen. They're going right. to yell you out of the room. Right. At one point, I, I, I was into... Um... Uh, climbing and stuff, you know, and I was reading about guys that do, you know, like climb up Mount Everest or do whatever. And uh, I don't, can't remember where I, where I read this, but some of the, the best guys, the guys that know what, what they're doing, what, what the fuck they're doing, they're, they're not using just pure oxygen tanks. They're using a mixture of those gases when they're going yeah. up. And it's because yeah. those guys are aware that, you know, you don't want just pure oxygen going into your lungs. You want a mixture of all these gases. And I can't remember where I saw this, but it kind of it's uh, it, it makes your brain mind. swell. Like uh, breathing pure oxygen makes your brain swell, and mm -hmm. that's why they're they're taking that drug acetazolamide. Um, it's it's used for mountain sickness. Mm -hmm. It's called, but also almost all almost all uh, mountain climbers who don't have the bottles with them, 
you can achieve some of those effects, not at the extreme altitude like Everest. Uh, at that point, you need a model, right? Right. But it's basically if you're climbing to like five, six thousand meters, uh, you can probably uh, get away without using the, the uh, bottle with supplemental oxygen and carbon dioxide because taking acetazolamide basically increases the the uh, carbon dioxide in your in your in your blood, mm -hmm. and that allows you to even though there's the oxygen uh, the uh, oxygen in the air is depleted at high altitude because you have more carbon dioxide in your body, you can retain it and use it at almost the same level as as if you're at at like sea level and breathing normal air. Now, it, mm -hmm. of course, you cannot compensate for things like seven, eight thousand, nine, almost like nine thousand meters. Right. That's really high. You can't. But do, like, yeah, you're not uh, gonna be super Superman at that yeah. level. It shows you that it's the carbon dioxide that allows you to use the oxygen and prevents many of the potentially lethal side effects that pure oxygen has. Hmm. So when you think people are put on, um, what do they call it in the uh, ventilators? Ventilators. It's probably they, that kills them. That kills them directly. Right. And you know, it, a lot. A lot of people are also saying that's a conspiracy theory, but. From what I've seen too, and it's just like it seems like everybody that's put on a ventilator just dies, and it's it like dies. a yeah. lot of people that don't and take some whatever drugs they they at least last longer or they just don't die. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it, I don't know why it's called a conspiracy theory. Ask any any doctor who works in emergency medicine mm -hmm. and ask them like, is intubation a, a traumatic procedure? They'll say yes. So it's like so if you arrive at the hospital and you're already like semi-comatose or like you're in an extremely depleted energetic state. Uh, recent studies show that 40% of people with, uh, who later died of COVID-19, 40% mm -hmm. already had lactic acidosis at the time of admission to the hospital. Way before getting intubated, way before becoming critical, they were already uh, had lactic acidosis. And lactic acidosis has 30% mortality rate just by itself, just by itself, right. even with treatment. So, so, so these people were already in this in this highly energetic and depleted state, and basically, like, um, I don't know if you know any surgeons, but the surgeons before you go for surgery, mm -hmm. they'll spend a lot of time examining you, mm -hmm. and uh, th this is like weeks to months before the surgery. And if you have any condition that they think might lead to you not surviving the surgery, they'll refuse to operate until that thing gets fixed. Uh, right. Like high high blood pressure, they'll tell you, no, go talk to your GP. Uh, start taking the blood pressure drugs. I will not operate on you until you drop down from like, I don't know, 180 to like 110 to down to like 120 over 80. They will refuse to operate. Mm. Or like if you have a extremely high blood glucose, they'll say no. You, 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 I mean, any, if, you, if you're like diabetic or like, uh, you know, with poorly controlled diabetes or like a newly new onset diabetes, you will, you will not be eligible for surgery unless it's like a life-saving thing where you basically like, you're going to die immediately unless you operate on you, like a, you have a bullet in your brain or, or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. if, you, if it's an elective surgery, the surgeon, the surgeons are usually extremely conservative and will refuse to do a traumatic procedure, which, which what surgery is, mm -hmm. uh, unless you are in a good enough uh, health, healthy state. Now, uh, getting intubated is known to be about as traumatic as a, mo a major surgery, right? Yeah. So if those two events are the same, then why, why are like basically why isn't the fact that intubation can kill recognized more and more over the news? Doctors know it, right? But if you talk to a doctor and say, look, if somebody's choking and they can't really breathe because their lungs are inflamed, we have no other we have no other recourse but to intubate them. That's mm -hmm. fine, right? Nobody nobody say don't intubate, but like. Uh, when people ask you, like, so nobody has asked the question, is intubation by itself a dangerous procedure? It's all as if, like, this is like a minor thing which we do when the patient needs to breathe. No, it's like you, you do this potentially lethal thing because it's like a cost-benefit analysis in a, in a dire situation, and you decide whether you're right or not, it's a separate story. You decide that the, that the benefits outweigh the risks, right? All but right. it's like... Nobody has, has brought up the fact that intubation is a, is the same in medical books is rated as the same level of a, a stressful event on the, on the organism mm -hmm. as a major abdominal surgery. Mm -hmm. They're the same. They have the same rating. I think it's like from zero to fourteen, and I think both are at about eight. Mm -hmm. So it's like not the worst you can get, but the key words here is is the same stressful rating as a major abdominal surgery. Mm -hmm. Now, does that sound like a mild thing to you? I don't think so. If somebody's then wheeled in and they're basically like so exhausted from the virus. Uh, or like already in an inflammatory state, lactic acidosis. Again, if you try to make a surgery on this person, most surgeons will refuse. They'll say, stabilize that motherfucker, right? right, right, like, right get right. them to a normal state where they're actually coherent, conscious. I can walk in, I can shake their hand, I can explain the, the risks of the surgery to them, right? Mm -hmm. But now people are coming in with the same kind of stressful thing and like, oh, let's do intubation on them. And basically, okay, maybe that's the only thing you can do because they're really critical. But like, why nobody has asked, like, 
Is do that th thing actually dangerous? Yeah. Do you think it's also part of maybe the patients are, especially in places like, you know, civilized places or whatever you want to call it, um, uh, like America, people are so not okay with being uncomfortable for a little bit that they are just immediately, they say, put me on a ventilator right away. I don't want to be, you know, because I had a friend in St. Petersburg, actually, that got COVID and uh, was, she said she had uh, trouble breathing for a day. The second day was a little bit better. Third day went away, but she did have trouble breathing. But she wasn't put on a ventilator, and you know she's still alive. Knock on wood, everything's good. So um, maybe that's one reason. I think another reason is that on average, uh, Americans uh, Americans lung health is actually poorer um, than places like uh, Eastern Europe. As bad as it's, I mean, it's as strange as it sounds, because many many people back home smoke. I'm yeah. sure the same same history yeah. in Russia and Ukraine, right? And you're like, oh, these people's these people's lungs should be terrible. No, actually, it's been shown that uh, tobacco can have a number of different protective effects. And I'm sure you saw the study showing that smokers have a lower risk of getting COVID and dying from it. Did you yeah. see that study? Yeah, there's a lot. So, there's a lot of stuff. Where, yeah. A lot of studies that people aren't aware of, like protection against Alzheimer's, all kinds of stuff you can find with tobacco. It's it's getting harder to find those studies though. But yeah, exactly. I, I but I think it's like it kind of shows you that there's there's a difference, fundamental difference between I guess the resilience. Of the American public, a lot more people are here or are chronically on some kind of a drug, especially an SSRI, which yeah. basically now now medicine has realized that the actually the, the syndrome that that this trouble breathing that leads eventually to potentially to lung failure and intubation that's actually caused by serotonin. It's mm -hmm. early stages of serotonin syndrome. So you can so of course if you're taking SSRI drugs, you, yours will be much more severe and is likely to lead to intubation and feelings like you can't breathe, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're not on an SSRI drug, yeah, it's it's, a, it's unpleasant, right? Mm -hmm. But I've been congested and I've had trouble breathing before when I had the cold. I mean, mm -hmm. I know how it feels. Right. And I think once you, also the SRI drugs tend to make you panic, like, like get into an anxiety and panic attack state. And that actually also makes you breathing even more difficult. So, of course, you will into the hospital in a situation like that. We're like, <gasps> I can't yeah. breathe. And you're always freaking out. I mean, chances are the doctor, the first thing they'll do is give you the oxygen, right? right? Right, uh, it's right. just you present with that symptom and they have no way of knowing whether your reaction is you're overreacting to to uh, compare to what your physiological state is or if you really are that bad, right? Yeah. And considering the litigious environment here, why wouldn't they give you why they'll give you everything to show that they did the best they could, yeah. right? Oh, Even that's if sometimes another. it's not in the best interest. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. yeah. The litigious stuff. Yeah, that that stuff, that's another thing that I that I don't love about being here, right? That it's like as soon as anything, it's like I'm gonna sue your fucking ass, and it's like exactly. Jesus Christ yeah. for yeah. what? For like painting my my fence like a, a like an obscene color, and you don't yeah. like it? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, again, I live in California. It's pretty, you know. If you live in a good, you know, if you got a good job and you live in a good neighborhood, life is pretty fucking easy here. Let's admit yeah, it, you know. Exactly. And but. It, and but it's these same people that have an easy life, you know, something I don't know. You cut them off in the fucking in in the in, par in the parking or something, and they'll I'll sue your. You know, it's like the first thing yeah. they say. Yeah. Which, I'll sue that conditioning here, and which I always I'm always like. I always tell everybody, I'm like, stop saying that. That's awful. You, know? <laughs> you say, let me teach you a nice Russian thing. It's called Pashol Nahui. Okay? You guys should exercise it and you, like you'll blow some steam. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, man. But it's just like, because also, but it creates this environment where like you're not chatting with your fellow human beings. It's like, again, hey, we can disagree, but let, let's like chat about it for a second. Do we really have to like throw in a third agency to figure out something we yeah. disagree on and something that happened and it's just make it so official it's like the court has uh, nothing better to do but it's, it's going to deal it's deal with our crap here which is a small argument and yeah. guess what the only people who, who win from the whole thing are the lawyers yeah right? exactly like, <laughs> drives me fucking nuts man because like i said can't tell you how many friends i have that say that for everything you know like oh you you must you messed up my order for this food i'm gonna you know it's just like oh my yeah. god for anything that happens um yeah, man, weird times. So, uh, you know, what we were talking about there, I, I, I went off on a tangent there for a second. I was going to say. Oh, know, yeah. What things do I do that basically like keep me sane? And I was saying yeah, like exercising you, creativity, uh, making sure you, you're you not entirely like um, um, controlled by routine because routine powerfully raises serotonin. And it's just just overload lowers metabolism. I mean, um, have you had situations where you've worked a really boring menial job where you basically like did the same thing over eight hours and then even like after the second or third hour you feel like you're about to collapse you, like yeah. your brain dead right it's yeah. the impression oh my god my brain is fried right yeah it's like yeah. it's it's such a simple and easy job but because it's so routine and so like similar from a step to step you basically like oh my god i i feel like this is so something uh, 
fundamentally anti-human about doing mm -hmm. the same thing over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Was it Einstein who said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over, over and expecting, over different, and results? expecting different results? Yeah. 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 So you know, it reminds me of that saying every time I am asked to do something a hundred times, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe it's just to produce something, but it's like, I'm like, there has to be another way. Like, I don't have to do it. It just sounds dumb, right? There yeah. has to be a smarter way to do this. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I've noticed that trend years ago, uh, not only mentally, but also when you're doing something physically, I've noticed that all the people that, uh, cause you know, have you ever had those friends that are just like, they'll do one marathon and then they'll do another one and then another one. And then, and then they just, and they just get hooked. They just get bitten by this thing or they do a triathlon yeah. and they're just obsessed yeah. with doing these things. And I've noticed that like, I don't think it's good for your brain to do, you know, I've done crazy, you know, I've done marathons and I've done, I don't know, workouts where you're doing, I don't know, just the same thing over and over again. I used to do, I used to do marathon as well, but like yeah. I did one and I said, okay, I did it, right? Mm -hmm. I saw what it's all about. Mm -hmm. I don't need to do it like 20 times in a row, but many of my friends continued and they're like, oh, what a pussy. You, you like, you chickened out. I'm like, no, I just don't think I need to destroy myself like, yeah. you know, once every two, three months because then I see you people, it yeah. takes like a month to recover. I don't have a month where I can lie in the bed and do nothing, yeah. right? And yeah. I have a wife and children and job and in life, right? Well, uh, the secret with those guys. Getting destroyed, yeah. And then, and then <laughs> re reanimating and recuperating for a month, I'm like, I'm sorry. I yeah. think there's a better yeah. way to live your life. The secret with those guys also, some of them are married and some of them do have kids, but you know what they're doing is they're getting away from that shit by training all exactly. the time. Exactly. <laughs> sorry, the sorry. Expression, Thank God it's Monday. They're like basically like the, the this is the running joke between people with like a really like a, um, stressful families. Mm -hmm. They're like they're going to work mm -hmm. to actually to actually calm down from like the weekend yeah. uh, like menagerie that yeah. they had at home. <laughs> sadly, sadly that is the case for a lot of people, not a just lot a of few, people, yeah. a lot of people. And I yeah, it's not the family's fault. I think it's the combination of extremely demanding work lifestyle, yeah. or basically like you lot you are it's no longer nine to five, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like look. Every job is stressful. If it wasn't stressful, they wouldn't be paying you, right? They'll be mm -hmm. like, they'll ask you to work for free. So that stress, I mean, I guess when you're working eight hours a day, as bad as it sounds, before the advent of mass communication, and even like before the phones, you go home and most of the thing stays at, stays at work, right? Maybe it stays in your mind, but like it's easier to, to kind of disengage from it when it's no longer right, right in front of you. Mm -hmm. When your phone is beeping every two, three seconds with email, angry emails, hey, yeah. did you email yeah, client man. that report? Like what happened to like to the to my TPS reports? TPS reports, <laughs> yeah. The, the office space. Classic. I mean, drives you crazy and probably makes you very irritable. Yeah. So oh, little man. children are irritating. Spouses can be irritating. Of course. Doing little doing things around the home because they they also require your attention. That's also tiring and irritating. So of course, if you're already irritated, irritated, life at, at home will, will seem like a hell, right? So you're like, oh my god, I can I can deal with this, and they go to triathlons or like. Uh, but begging for Monday to come back to come sooner so yes. they can go back and then to they work. get that reward of you know like you said you beat your fucking ass up but yeah. then at the end you, you know you got that medal and you feel like you did something and of Jeez. course I totally understand why people are attracted to it you know but yeah but I don't think it's good for your mental brain e either you know because I've done also like 500 burpees you know I've done crazy workouts like that but you always notice at the end man you're just drained like yes you did something cool because also in today's age you know you'll videotape yourself and put it on YouTube or Instagram whatever and you get more applause and you know play yeah. oh i yeah. did something crazy nobody's ever yeah. done but yeah i always try to steer people away from doing a lot of stuff like that because every once in a while yeah i get it you want to like do a 10 mile run and just fuck yourself up every so often i get it it's cool but well, I the reason it works when it's every once in a while sorry to drop is because it's new when you're doing it rarely Bingo. it's like a break from your routine even if that thing itself so everything is new unless you start doing it like too often right mm -hmm. so it's like a marathon once or twice a year it's probably going to be a great experience because it'll be like it'll be so like much time has passed between these two things that yeah. you experience something new and especially if the course is new you're exactly. running with new people but if you're doing it like the things that like people are like oh i run five miles every day i'm like yeah, really yeah. Uh -huh. it's like <laughs> You cannot possibly tell me that you find a new route to run these five hours. I'm like, oh, of course I know. I run the same yes. route. I'm like, yes. that must be really crushingly boring. And, yeah, and even that, that is okay. Route. How about the ones that do, I do five miles every day on the fucking treadmill or on the elliptical machine? I, I don't just know. I'm brand dead just looking at them. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. I have some friends who are cyclists too, you know, and, and yeah, they'll just put on the TV. Even worse, they'll put on some news on the TV and then they'll sit and bike for two, three hours straight just sitting in their living room. And I'm like... 
it's just not good for your brain. It's just not good for you. Physically also is not good. And it's just, yeah, like you said, man. So I try to steer people away from that and doing, like you said, doing stuff, you know, it doesn't, it also doesn't have to be a crazy workout. It could be easy workout, but just something different, always trying to changing it up. And like you said, that's exactly the case is that if you're doing it every once in a while, yeah, that is the break from your normal break or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I think what you can remind him of is that, listen, there's no such thing as you're doing this for your body and basically it doesn't matter that if the brain is bored. They're the same thing, right? So it's like if you're if you're basically doing something that's really harming your brain, guess what? The brain is the you know master conductor of the entire organism. If you're taxing your brain, uh, there are already studies that show that if you're doing boring things that are like supposedly good for you, the effect is really not nearly as beneficial if you're doing something that basically you, you enjoy and you feel like you're into it, right? It's kind of like a new job. Exactly. You start and you're new, right? You're the new kid on the block. Everything is new. Everything is exciting. Now, constant seeking of novelties can also be pathological, but the other extreme, which I think now we're too much into the other extreme, is like everybody's to tolerating too much routine. That mm -hmm. needs to uh, that needs to go. I mean, like you, it, you're better off erring on the side of novelty than erring on the side of routine. And people are like, yeah, but that's that's for younger people. When you get older, you start <laughs> to prefer routine. I think it's actually the other way around. We get older because we start to prefer routine. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. that we prefer routine because we've gotten older. <laughs> Um, yeah, there was um, uh, uh, Obama's uh, uh, physical coach, basically, like, uh, I know you know, but Obama used to play basketball every day, like when he was in the White House. Right, right, uh, right. Almost every day. Uh, and basically, like, they asked his physical coach, like, well, well, why do that? And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I've seen enough medical research and I've worked with enough people to tell you that it's, it's, uh, we don't stop playing because we got older. We actually got older, we get older because we stop playing. Yep. So he's like, you got to maintain that. Uh, at least a little bit of the childhood uh, attitude of seeking novelty and enjoying novelty, right? Yeah, yeah. Of course, as you grow older, you have other responsibilities, right? So you're gonna have less. You'll be. You'll have less free time to do that. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean you have to actively shun it. Like what some older people are being advised to do. Be like, oh, this is for young people. Like uh, mm -hmm. I shouldn't be going out and enjoying myself. It's just. It's not. It doesn't match my age. No. It's you became that way because you were shunning away, you were you were like shying away from things that actually keep you young and healthy. Yeah, it's so funny, man. You bring that up because I am like I'm I am not a fan at all of you know, and there's a lot of those like biohacker kind of Tim Ferriss types that yeah. have these insane fucking routines in the morning. We're like, I get up in the morning and I drink deuterium depleted water. First thing I do. And the, <laughs> then the next thing I do is I squeeze lemon juice into my asshole. And then it's just like this on this, this elaborate like routine thing. And then, and then they always, what they do is always they'll say like, well, you can break it down and make it a smaller, more easier routine. But like you said, I always thought like, why have a routine? Like, I, I don't think it's just... It just makes you so dull, you know, and yeah. boring. Like, I, I don't know if I'm, I mean, like you said, I get it. Well, it's a ritual. It's yeah. almost like a religion. And they belong to a club, an exclusive club, mm -hmm. and they do all these things because that's what separates them from you. It's like, mm -hmm. have you ever drunk, uh, like, deuterium water? Like, uh, you, <laughs> you, you, you're Russian conspiracist, right? And you're like, that's, how, that's, what, that, that's what they think separates them, them from you. And I've yeah. got in the same attitude. They're like, oh, you just like, all you do is like, you drink your local alcohol that you guys make in Bulgaria. You guys are brutes. I'm like... <laughs> To be honest with you, the brutes kind of seem <laughs> like more you fun lately. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the, they still suffer and they have a primitive lifestyle and a lot of things that I don't like, right? That's why I'm in America. Yeah. But guess what? They're kind of like more down to earth now. Yeah. Uh, over the last 20 years, they at least they seem to be. And more like capable of enjoying life and interacting with other human beings. Yes. Here, everybody's about, let me separate myself from the crowd to like Bubble. stand stand out, right? Yeah. To stand out. Over there, I guess maybe a bit too much for the other extreme. It's like, oh, let's all blend in. We're all one big group, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you kind of want a little bit of both, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't want to sit in one extreme for too long. It gets boring, right? Bingo. It Bingo. gets Bingo. annoying. It, it, it can become a routine, both standing out and becoming too much of a part of a group. Both of these things, when done over time for too long, can become boring. And I and I try to break the routine, right? I mean, I go to Bulgaria. After about three weeks, it starts to get on my nerves. It's like <laughs> nobody really wants to do anything there. It's like, ah, yeah. oh, forget about it. Nothing will come out of it. I'm like, have you tried? <laughs> have you tried? They're like, that is oh, true. that's such, yeah. such an American attitude, right? I'm like, okay, I see it because here, and many times they're, they're all right because it's just the environment is set up so very corrupt, right? You have to bribe the right people, right? Mm -hmm. But many times it's not. And actually I've tried things like I opened like a, like a, a, a subsidy of the company of Idea Labs in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. Like initially people were like, you're insane. They will immediately start asking you, I'll turn on the lights in a minute. They'll immediately start asking you for bribes. Uh, you cannot do any decent manufacturing in Bulgaria. You know what? All this turned out to be false. Now, of course, <laughs> it's a small company. Maybe if it grows, 
I will attract the wrong kind of attention. But it turned out that simply they haven't tried. They're like, oh, you cannot have, you cannot find these bottles, like these bottles, right, mm -hmm. uh, in Bulgaria. They're not available. I'm like, really? Just a quick search and you find like 20 suppliers, right? <laughs> so I called yeah. them and usually they're suspicious because I think their business is a front for something else. But they also sell the bottle. So I show up there and like they always try to sell me something else like, oh, did you did you really come for the bottles? Or did you want to buy this nice AK-47? Yeah. I'm like, no, I actually came for a bottle. Yeah. Well, there's that extremism again where it's like people, you know, if you have a new idea, they just want your idea to be perfect right off the bat and have everything figured out. And it's like, well, it doesn't happen like that, man. Like, give me, like you said, let me try. And I, try, I'm yeah. pretty sure it's not going to be perfect like I want it right off the bat. But, you know, give me some practice yeah. and it'll happen. And uh, So yeah. I try to combine the best of both worlds. But like I said, too much time in, in, in Bulgaria starts to become um, defeatist. Like they basically like nothing works, uh, you know. So all we're gonna do is like uh, drink and watch TV and have fun. I'm like, okay, for three weeks, fine. Yeah. I'll tell. I mean, it's, it is fun for three weeks. After a while, you're like, I'm, am I wasting my time? I mean, there are better things that I could be doing, of or at course. least I want to be doing other things. But over there, the environment, the, everybody's like, and it's mostly social pressure. It's like, just like I said, turns out that the environment is not as bad as as they're presenting it, mm -hmm. simply because they've given given a hope long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. So there is, you can do things not as freely as in the United States, mm -hmm. but you can still do them, right? Yeah. And the other, the other way around here. So if I, if I stay here for too long, basically it's like, oh, you just need to work and focus on your career and make money. I'm like, um, okay. But like, mm -hmm. what do you, Money is ultimately just like electricity. It's like a means to an end, right? Yeah. Uh, if you have what the, enough money to like to satisfy your needs, why do you need more money? Well, <laughs> you can never have too much money. I'm like, sure you can. Money can actually <laughs> – so it's more dangerous than a gun. You give a gun to a person, can kill 30 people. You give money to the wrong kind of person, can kill the world. Mm -hmm. I right? can destroy entire countries. <laughs> so they just keep looking at me. It's like, give me this fun. It's like, are you out of your mind? It's like – <laughs> no, just give, if you have a, if you have more money than you need, just give us the the excess that you have. We'll never complain. But if you notice, like there's a there actually was a study done on that. All the lottery winners, the big lottery winners in the United States, the Powerball, like the really that they they get a couple hundred million. Mm -hmm. If you look at all, all the winners over the last twenty years, the vast majority of them died yeah. within within a few years after winning. Yeah. It was such a shock. This change of financial status yeah. now it shows that money can kill, right? Yep. Because just by itself, it's just like a, it's like it's like energy, it's like power, yeah. right? Yeah, and, and pressure. unless you put it to good use, yeah, exactly, it creates the pressure. Yeah, you Maybe have you that real... cousin from fucking Bulgaria. Hey, man, yeah. I haven't seen you in 30 <laughs> years, but you want to owe, owe me like a little, you know, a couple hundred thousand? Like I need it, man. Yeah, yeah. and, it. and just yeah. that yeah. you'd probably feel even worse. And it's like that. Then if you were close with them, and then now I don't know where. Like there's this pressure. Like I don't really know you, but I got to give you the money because I feel bad. And oh my god, man. Because I have so much if i don't give you basically i feel like you know or, you know this person really truly needs the money i know he's not going to use it for good yeah, things yeah you probably just snort up coke or whatnot but like if i don't <laughs> give the money i'm an asshole vodka all the time. Blah, 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 blah. or vodka whatever right yeah. if i don't give the money i'm an asshole i'm a rich asshole who now thinks that who is he's better than them yeah. but if i do give the money i'm enabling really bad behavior yeah, and it's like this constant tension yeah. and of course there's the more nefarious part like somebody else is like hmm let's relieve him of this money oh, yeah. let's find oh, ways yeah. to like uh put the money in bad ventures or like have him uh like uh, assign a portion to his like wife who then divorces immediately or and things like that sued again like, by the way they'll pull up some yeah. shit from years ago and hey i want to <laughs> sue your ass now and it's like Jesus. exactly yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, that's how it goes. But so, I mean, yeah, so it's both sides. I mean, so, so change is very important. Um, and, and it's just really, I guess, trying to make the best that you can with the current situation, mm -hmm. um, which, of course, requires energy. So making sure your, your metabolic state is as good as you can. Don't become orthorexic, right? I mean, don't become to the point where it's like, oh, my God, I'm feeling really crappy today. I must do everything in my power to immediately restore myself back to where I was yesterday. Mm. doesn't work like that. Maybe there is a reason why you're in the situation. Maybe you did catch a virus or maybe you were staying up until 2 a.m. like last night um, and you're no longer in your 20s, right? Things like that. So mm -hmm. it's like, look, evaluate the situation and see if there's a reason for you to be there. Of course, always work on improvement, but don't create unrealistic expectations because the reason you felt great, like let's say like three days ago, was because there were factors at play that they will never be the same. Every day the world is different. Every second it is different. And for you to expect that you're going to have the exact same matching factors that made you feel that great three, four, five, six days ago, it's it's delusion, right? You, mm -hmm. But you can always work to feel better, not towards some chimeric condition that you think, you, maybe you just think you felt that much uh, good six days ago. Maybe it's just a figment of your emotion. Because now you're feeling shitty, you tend to idolize the way you felt like better like a few days ago. So it's like, 
don't accept the current situation if it's not good, right? But also don't try to like, I don't know, create unrealistic uh, goals, right? Yeah, uh, it's important it stuff you're saying. Yeah, because I find a lot of people become so fucking obsessed with it, man. They just, like you said, everything's got to, no, I didn't have the, the red light on last night or I didn't do that. And it's just like, like you said, man, I mean, some, you, you got to know how to let go too, of course. And we're not saying go, go de- deep, deep down into a dark hole and just sit there, right? But it's like, <laughs> yeah, of course, yes. It's, but it's if, like, if you find yourself there, reevaluate what brought you there yeah. and start work, working towards climbing out. Yeah. But to sit there and wallow and self pity, be like, oh my God, or or get like the opposite, the opposite, get manically motivated to get to the point where you used to be before. You're like, ah, it's possible. I'm gonna do it if I take these 20 supplements. Or like, you're gonna create additional stress that now you're creating now, but you're gonna pay for the price for it later. You don't even realize how this is affecting you until later. So it's like, don't create new things. Don't create storm in a teacup because you're in a bad state, and, and you know by by pushing yourself too hard to get out of it, you end up making things worse. Mm. Very important stuff, man, especially, you know, in our circles, like I said, because I know a lot of people that are super obsessive about that stuff. And yeah, I mean, how do you let go, man? How do you have fun? I mean, do you do let anything go, naughty, uh, naughty? Like, you do any naughty, naughty stuff, <laughs> anything like that? <laughs> I mean, like, uh, uh, you know, I have a wife and kids. So like, it's basically now everything in a lockdown. Um, we basically don't have much of a time, um, you know, to really go out. And and uh, I don't want to say we, don't, we, we can't have fun, but it's like the kids are always with us. And during the day, they have school, um, and I have to do my work. My wife has to do her work. So it's like it's it's hard. I think basically, I mean, what we do is we try to get out of the city for for a few days, uh, almost every weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, we usually get a car and like drive in like Virginia and Maryland and in the vicinity around here. The Appalachians are not that far away, maybe yeah. like 50, 60 miles. Mm-hmm. Um, so we try to get the kids out out of, out of the city because it's really like here because it's such a democratic city. Everybody believes so much in this virus. The city becomes like a ghost town. Like mm-hmm. a ghost town over the weekend. Yeah, Everybody's same thing here, man. In. Yeah, everybody's <laughs> locked in, locked down, and and because uh, we live in an apartment building, um, which I like, I don't like houses. To me, that's too isolating. I prefer living amongst other people, or at least I used to, <laughs> mm. until the lockdown started. And basically, like our apartment faces the building is like in the, it's almost like a square, right? Mm-hmm. And our apartment f- faces inward, the inner yard. So you're seeing a lot of other apartments' windows around you, mm-hmm. and it's like almost like a prison. All the weekend, everybody's sitting in front of the window of the living room, right? <laughs> so you see, you're basically like surrounded by these like by these hundreds Prisoners. of people sitting and staring into the window yeah. like freaking lunatics, right? Yeah, so that's, there's that deep so dark hole, dark dark hole we were talking about, eh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I try to get out of that, you know, um, over the weekend. Um, and you know, uh, now the bars are closed, but when they're open, I would go out, you know, uh, a few days a night and you know meet some friends. And it's um, have a drink or know, two. Any any tips yeah, drink on uh, drinking? Any special way? Any any biohacking? Sure. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. So basically, the the metabolism of alcohol depends on uh, two things. Uh, number one, proper oxidative state because alcohol is a reductant. Mm-hmm. So basically, uh, alcohol donates electrons. So taking things that will accept those electrons tends to speed up the metabolism of alcohol. Already proven in both humans and animals. But it, it turns out it's only about 20% uh, of the factors that affect the speed of metabolism of alcohol. Turns out the biggest factor, over 80%, is the total estrogenic load in the in the organism. So okay. I discovered some old studies which found out that when basically when you block the synthesis of estrogen in rats or mice uh, by giving them an aromatase inhibitor, they metabolize they metabolized alcohol at level at, at speeds 10 to 12 times faster. Wow, so they, they almost never got drunk. And I actually confirmed that myself. I've tried, um, I prefer the aromatase inhibitor exemestane. Mm-hmm. So just a few milligrams uh, because it's, it's really potent. And I don't know why they, they approved it clinically at 25 milligrams daily. I guess for women with breast cancer because they need to suppress the estrogen fully. Mm-hmm. But human studies show that even 5 milligrams a day drops your estrogen by like 70%, 7-0. And that's more than enough to feel the effects of for alcohol drinking. So just a few drops. I go out. I mean, um, the last time, maybe like two weeks ago, I went out with some Bulgarians and a few Russians. Mm. Um, actually, he's half Ukrainian. His name is uh, Vladislav. Vladislav. Uh, there you go. Yeah, Vladislav. <laughs> and, and actually, his mom is from Kiev. So oh. needless to say, he's a big vodka drinker, right? <laughs> and I know. I know when I go out with this guy. You got to get fucked no matter up. What promises, no, yeah, exactly, you got to no get shit-faced, my friend. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, he goes to the bar and he's like, hey, 
uh, waiter, four bottles of vodka here. And of course, the waiter was like, no, nah, we can't serve four bottles. <laughs> like, you got to drink it one by one. He's like, you know what? Now you're pissing me off. Now we're going to drink two of these. <laughs> so I'm like, please, Vladislav, don't do that. We're going to be like, we're going to be puking on this stuff. He's like, come on. What happened to you? You used to be a cool person. I'm like, okay, let's drink. So we take Zemestane. I can handle two bottles of vodka. Uh, so that's two liters. So two one liter bo- bottles of vodka. Oh, yeah, of course, I, I'm drinking chases as well. I'm not drinking the pure because that will like... That's the secret, baby. Little pickles yeah. or what? What do you guys chase it with? Yeah? Pickles, uh, like siliotka. Siliotka. Like that. That's uh, what do they call it in English? Uh, herring? Herring. Yeah, herring. Yeah, herring. pickled yeah. herring or something. Yeah. yeah, salty pickled herring. Um, so things like that. I mean, like sour cabbage also works pretty well because it's got a lot of salt. Mm-hmm. If it's done the right way. And salt uh, basically prevents the... the uh, 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 rising of serotonin mm-hmm. and alcohol is a serotonin agonist that's one of the bad sides of it okay. so it's like basically but when I, when I take the aromatase inhibitor like if I take if I drink two bottles of vodka without anything man the next day I'm just a freaking ghost like I can wow. barely <laughs> open my eyes you got this sounding headache even the slightest <laughs> sound and light irritates the hell out of you right you just oh, want to yeah. be left alone oh, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're like a shaking irritable mess right that's funny and, that. and of course it's not a good state to be if you have if you have a wife and two kids running around so like i don't so but if i take the exam state mm-hmm. i'm actually sober by about 6 to 7 a.m the next morning or at least i feel oh, sober man. i'm sure mm-hmm. there's still alcohol in me but i'm actually functional mm-hmm. i i'm able to drive <laughs> so i'm able to hold conversation i'm able to take the kids to school i'm able to do work right so it's like so estrogen is per- perhaps the, the predominant factor in a, in a speeding up estrogen in an alcohol metabolism. And another thing that also works well, can be used either or together or either one, is, is some kind of an androgenic steroid because that yeah. also tends to block the effects of estrogen. So uh, like things like dihydrotestosterone. And I don't know if you notice, if you talk to any bodybuilders, mm-hmm. they're actually usually pretty good at drinking. Like, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Metabolism. I know one guy, he, yeah, he is actually pretty good with every fucking drug. This guy can drink. Smokes tons of weed, uh, super into psychedelic stuff. He, he told me a story when he went to do ayahuasca, you know, which is so popular now. He had to do like a triple dose. They gave him one dose. They, everybody was, you know, flat out on the floor. And then this guy, he, he did another one. And then he was like, oh, I started to tap in on the second one. And then like the third one is when he, I was like, Jesus Christ, man. But well, I don't well, know. What an animal. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I don't know if that's a good thing, you know, but it is. Yeah, but well, it's true. <laughs> it is. It means it, it raises your tolerance because most most of the psychedelics are serotonergic. They also have dopamine po- properties, right? But uh-huh. the actual hallucinations where you like really see these, uh, you know, uh, bright and like weird images, that is done through one of the serotonin receptors. So if he needs much higher dosage to get to that level, uh-huh. that means he's either metabolizing it very fast or his, his system, his serotonin, his dopamine system is very strong and it's preventing those effects. So uh-huh. he, he needs a much higher dosage to overload his dopamine. So mm. again, high, do- high high androgens, high dopamine, low estrogen, all of these things are good. Mm. Um, so, spe- But specifically for alcohol, alcohol itself is estrogenic um, and also just, you know, and it uh, put, puts a burden on the liver, right? But right. Uh, And while you have alcohol in your system, your liver will be busy metabolizing the alcohol. And of course, since you're always producing estrogen, that estrogen will remain unexcreted. It's the, again, the liver that processes most of the estrogen that gets produced in your body. Uh, liver attaches something called glucuronic acid to it, makes mm-hmm. it more water soluble, and you pee it out through your kidneys. Now, if your liver is overburdened because it's processing alcohol, busy processing alcohol, that estrogen will start accumulating. So that's also part of the reason why you feel it crappy. But also, estrogen itself burdens the liver, so it gets into this vicious cycle. And that's why, with with advancing age, when your est- when your estrogens are at the same level, but your androgens start declining. And the androgens are the natural estrogen antagonists in the body if you're not taking anything exogenously, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why people with age uh, are less capable of tolerating alcohol, why they have worse hangovers mm. or like they have a few drinks, they feel drunk like the next day for like another 24 hours and whatnot. All of this is because the liver is not able to process as much alcohol as before. And one of the reasons is estrogen is burdening the functioning of the two enzymes alcohol dehydrogenase and aldehyde dehydrogenase Mm -hmm. and those those enzymes are basically sped up by androgens and inhibited by estrogens Mm -hmm. so you if you if you low estrogen or block its effects you're releasing the brakes on those enzymes and about 80 percent of the speed of the enzymes depends on the ratio of androgens to estrogens Mm -hmm. the higher the the androgen to estrogen ratio the faster the the enzymes that would work the rest of the 20 percent is the oxidative state of the organism because the cofactors for both the cofactor for both enzymes is NAD and NAD is the oxidized version of of that uh, of the enzyme um, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide 
which you can raise by taking niacinamide. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. Or methylene blue, because methylene blue will actually take your reduced version, which is NADH, and it will oxidize it back into NAD. Uh -huh. So either you raise the levels of NAD by taking a precursor like this, niacinamide, uh -huh. or you oxidize the already existing NAD, which is in the form of NADH, you're oxidizing it back into NAD. That's the other 20% of alcohol metabolism. Okay. So would it make a, do you think it makes much of a difference then, you know, since they say, you know, beer is more estrogenic because it has more estrogen, do you think it makes much of a difference then, like to choose like, a, like vodka or choose some sort of liquor or not really, it's not going to be a huge difference. I'm saying doing all this other stuff is more important. So here's the thing. Yes, beer does contain more estrogenic chemicals because the hops uh, contain some highly estrogenic things like 8-phenylnaringenine. You can look it up. Uh -huh. It's a very potent estrogen in hops, right? Uh -huh. But here's the thing. Uh, alcohol itself has got a burning effect on the liver. So it's like it's a trade-off, right? If you're drinking beer, it, technically you're drinking a more estrogenic drink, but it's got less alcohol, less alcohol. per unit yeah. and more water and more liquids, and it's got B vitamins. If right. it's a non-filter beer, you got the B vitamins, which, which actually help you metabolize the alcohol mm -hmm. and help you excrete the estrogen. Mm -hmm. If you're drinking harder liquor like vodka or something even stronger, you don't have the the the, the highly estrogenic compounds like uh, the, the ones that are found in hops, but it's all, a lot more pure alcohol and a lot harder on the liver. Mm -hmm. So it's like so it's got a lot more to process. So it's with kind less of a trade liquid, off. Like kind high. of a trade off. Yeah. yeah. So high. I actually don't feel as bad drinking beer. I can drink. I can probably drink a beer every fifteen to twenty minutes throughout the entire night, mm -hmm. and then go and sleep for two hours, and then wake up and be okay. Mm. If I drink the two bottles, I mean, if I drink an equivalent amount of alcohol, but from vodka, without taking any precautions like the aromatase inhibitor or niacinamide or vitamin B1, thiamine, because that uh, it doesn't help with the metabolism of alcohol, but, but vitamin B1 is very important for brain health, mm -hmm. and alcoholics can sometimes develop this condition called uh, uh, Wiernicke korsakoff uh, psychosis. It's due to vitamin B1 deficiency yeah. in the brain. And then they start so, having anyways, white white fever. What do they call it? White something like that. Something, yeah, and also yeah. get demented and things like that. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. anyway, so if, if I drink the equivalent amounts of liquor from beer or from vodka, I can handle the beer uh, without any precautions, right, in, or any like helping substances. But if I drink the exact same amount of vodka without taking any of those things, that amount of concentrated alcohol, you know, flooding your liver. It, it creates this vicious cycle with estrogen, right? So you you down a few vodkas, right? So mm -hmm. your, your liver is busy, you know, uh, processing the alcohol. It's a little bit estrogenic, pure alcohol itself, but not as estrogenic as the beer, right? But also it's burning your liver a lot more because you drank so much more alcohol. Mm -hmm. And now the estrogen you're producing endogenously in your body from other activities cannot get processed. So mm -hmm. now that estrogen is starting to affect the functioning of those two enzymes, right? Because mm -hmm. it's building up. And now you you you're able less to uh, you your your you metabolize alcohol more and more slowly, right? So it, yeah. it, it kind of it's like a build up effect. And I found that I can get more fucked up by drinking <laughs> hard liquor uh, than than basically drinking beers, yeah. even if they're like really hot with like four. But different. it makes sense, yeah, because a lot of people, like I said, in the you know in the health world, they'll say don't drink beer; it's so estrogenic. And like you said, and I always ha had that thought too that it's like there, there's you know both of them are it's not, not that clear cut. Both of them have different effects. I guess it yeah. comes down to the amount. But if you're going to be drinking a lot of alcohol, the fact that the beer contains more water. Yeah. And the B vitamins is actually less dangerous. Yeah, especially if you have like a good, like, I don't know, some German, like you said, unfiltered beer or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Or yeah. Bavarian or whatever. One of or those Bavarian. Kind. You know, in Russia to this day, in Bulgaria, beer is not classified as alcohol. It's classified as food. <laughs> I didn't know that, man. Seriously. That's actually, uh, yeah, what I told you. Yeah, it is. It is. I, mean, I think Putin was trying to to change the classification. He was so unpopular that he got afraid that they <laughs> actually turned people against him. So he dropped these plants. Don't fuck <laughs> with like, our beer, man. Baltica uh, 7, all the way, Baltica baby. 7, I drink it. <laughs> That's and my so, favorite. So speaking of which, there's a famous joke in Bulgaria. It's like uh, four alcoholics are sitting like on the back porch. And one of them is like, damn, man. We drank so much vodka last night. Now I'm drinking my seventh beer and I still can't sober up. So they're sobering up by drinking yeah. beer. Yeah, <laughs> that's classic. And then you go into the sauna and sweat it all out there, huh? That's classic right. Stuff. That's right. So are you a fan of saunas and stuff like that? Very much so. I think it's a great uh, uh, it's it's a it's a it's a great exercise for um, basically you're getting rid you're speeding up the the internal a lot of the internal detox enzymes and also the immune system, which has been shown to work optimally. At, at temperatures of the body about above 38 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, not sure if you saw that discussion we had. I had with Ray on one of the latest podcasts that actually you can cure tumors with heat therapy. Uh, about 40 to 50 percent, you can achieve full cures mm -hmm. 
just by raising the temperature of the tumor yep. to above above 40 degrees centigrade. That's a little, that's uncomfortable. There's actually course, clinics in Russia which specifically focus on that, and they're for for cancer cells and stuff, and uh, for people with cancer. I mean, and yeah, they 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 have a lot of saunas. It's like a big. I can't remember the name of them, but they have clinics like that exist around the world, man. Yeah, where people just yeah. go and sauna every day. You know. I mean, if, and if you improve your immune system, many things start to work better. Like if you had any kind of latent infection, which mm-hmm. many people do. Mm-hmm. Uh, many people, I think it's like 20% of the population has like an undiagnosed minor upper respiratory tract infection mm-hmm. because it's a bacteria that it's, it's there, the immune system keeps it under control, but it cannot get rid of it completely because they're metabolically not up to speed, right? right. So and that over time causes inflammatory reaction, can cause fibrosis in the lungs and even worse things, right? So mm-hmm. if you go to the sauna, you raise your body temperature by raising the ambient temperature obviously you raise your core body temperature like 38 39 degrees you basically like bringing the immune speed the immune system up to speed you're getting rid of most of these pathogens right mm-hmm. you also lower inflammation uh, it's shown that that high temperatures uh, inhibit the working of the enzymes cox and lox they're the ones that produce the inflammatory mediators from PUFA. Cox and uh, Lox is the name of yeah. the enzymes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a good name, man. Cox and Cycle, Lox. <laughs> cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase. So it's like they're abbreviated okay. because Cox and Lox. I, I like the, I <laughs> I love the abbreviations. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, low temperatures activate the activity of those enzymes. So That's that why would be my next question show. for you then. So would yeah. you... Are you a fan then of go? You know, like Russian style is like to go, alternate, alternate, alternate to go to the don't, cold. Don't don't keep yourself in a freaking sub sub zero frigid conditions uh, for too long because mm-hmm. then you start going into that this torpor slash hibernation mode, mm-hmm. which is what that they thought humans cannot hibernate. Yes, we can. If serotonin rises to a certain level, and it does mm-hmm. when there is not enough light and the temperature is chronically low in your ambient, basically the body says, okay, this world is really, you shouldn't be running around and like having fun and partying and whatnot. It's mm-hmm. time to sleep until mm-hmm. the conditions are better. So we can also hibernate, and this can be done by raising serotonin. And serotonin rises under low temperatures and low light. Mm-hmm. So so that's why I think, like, think about it. People spend a few hours in the sauna, and then they go and they jump into the into the they cut out the hole in the in the ice right uh-huh. and they go into the water. Uh-huh. But I don't think they spend there for anything more than like five to ten minutes. No, then in Russia, see- it's always been it's it's only seriously it's only recently because of fucking Instagram and these stupid social show off you know dick measuring contest networks. Yeah, it's like because in Russia you just jump in you jump out that's it man like yeah, you're good it. you you got you have trust me like everybody thinks you have you have balls just for doing that. But of course Instagram takes it to the next level where now people I see so many accounts people go in in there and they sit there for 10 sit minutes there. 20 that's minutes, ridiculous 30 minutes and i'm like yeah. we get it we get it you can fucking sit in there you're so cool like you know you're so, so tough but, right <laughs> yeah that's one of my like yeah it's just like we all know you're not doing that because you've clearly researched this and thought about it you're just doing it because you want to look cool man like we yeah. all know that you know let, let me turn on the lights do your thing brother do your thing yeah so that that's the difference where you know it's like is there any good Ukrainian Russian saunas over there by the way in DC or we have one here well it's obviously not closed in DC now. but if you go out out of DC most of the Ukrainians and the Russians they don't live in the DC proper they live like because it's, it's there's no point I mean the taxes are high mm-hmm. like basically the cost of living is very high and uh, I found out that many Russians and Ukrainians when they move over here they do like to buy large properties I guess like because we used to live in a very crammed up areas like all of them were in a uh, you know, like blocks, right? Like mm-hmm. in these apartment buildings, they call they call them comic condos, right? <laughs> uh, so now when they come over here, I guess they want more space. So many of them want to buy the house with the big yards, sometimes even like ranches and farms. Of course. So most of the Russians that I know that are well off, or at least like uh, you know they you know they build a good life for themselves here, they're in the suburbs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but basically, you go out there. Uh, I mean, there's a Russian restaurant in DC. It's called Marivana, mm-hmm. uh, but right now it's closed. Actually, the the girl. Whose mom is the is the lead cook there, the, the like the, the chief chef, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, she used to help me do the packaging with for Idea Labs. Oh, cool. <laughs> used to work very nice. She was like the administrative assistant for my former employer, and the the company was right above Marivana. Mm-hmm. So my former employer was like on the sixth floor, and Marivana was on the first. So guess where we were <laughs> going drinking, like socialize. But uh, and there's also something called the Russia House, oh. which ironically is owned by Americans, but all the staff there is Russian. Yeah, so you go in, <laughs> it's the same idea. The I think here. Yeah. From like I think Baltica is like from number one to number nine or something. Oh, there's like eleven um, even, man. There's like eleven. I, I, okay, yeah. I, I don't even know. I only I have to remember in Russia. I did not say. I remember there's a I not say. It's like one one. It's like double ones. You know, I don't know how many they have now, man. They must have Baltica Seven is very popular. Seven is say. like yeah, it's like the classic. 
like you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so those are the Russian restaurants proper in DC. But if you go outside of DC, they actually start getting the mom and pop shops, mm -hmm. um, basically like a, a like a family owned Russian restaurant. So if you want to get the real Russian food, you probably should go there. Um, uh, yeah. But of course, like it's it's not really like a party place. It's a quiet place. It's really a family place, mm -hmm. and most people that go there are usually families, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want to get more like the rowdy slash clubby russian scene mm -hmm. you go to like russia house which is actually turns into a club at night um and then if you, if you want like the slightly less rowdy but still more like a um party outgoing atmosphere you go to marijuana because you, you sit down they, they have this big uh, the guy oleg comes out with the accord accordion <laughs> Player and he starts like hey. playing those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. and like oh, all these kind of like classic hits. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> yeah. Good stuff. So, so their place, yeah, they also sell us as well, uh, but they're kind of hard to get to because uh, there's a wait list for most of them. I found out, so it's it's almost like a club because they they tend to be not very big, and yeah. now they're so it becomes so popular in the area. Yeah. Now you basically unless you're a club member, if you're just a member of the general public, they'll still take you in. Mm -hmm. But first, you gotta pay more, and second, there are very few openings. You mm -hmm. gotta reserve things like two weeks in advance, and I just can't plan two weeks in advance. Too no. many things change over time. So, and it's and again, it's such a I don't know. Uh, it's just a, it's a very new, fresh thing to Americans. So they're you know they yeah. you know, like all things they get excited. Very popular about. right now, yeah. Yeah, but like you know, in Russia, you can go. There's saunas everywhere. You know, you can even. My favorite thing is always to do. You know, we always go and rent a house. You know, which is just a sauna on the inside. You know, I'm sure you have those probably in Bulgaria too. And it's, just the sun, you just hang out there the whole day or in the night. forest. Or, yeah, or exactly. And like yeah. in the yeah. forest, you know, and you have your, your little, uh, you know, you, you, maybe, maybe if you're lucky, you're next to a river so you can go into the sun and then jump into the river, but it's good stuff. So, you know, you got me thinking about uh, sun as, like I said, we were talking about all these dudes that are showing off. We're doing, um, uh, cold, uh, sitting there for like, the, yeah, just like yeah. What's this guy, Jack Cruz, who is a fan of like the, the cold thermogenesis. Yeah. I think that's, that's part of like part of the reason. Yeah. It's like first they want to show they're tough. Second, now medicine is trying to convince them that exposing yourself to chronic cold mm -hmm. is somehow good for you because it turns your white fat into brown fat and makes you like burn more calories. Yeah, but that's, that's the stressful that, that way. That idea has been around for you know at least some time in that health sphere. Yeah. And I was and I was looking into it at once too, and I didn't. I didn't find anything convincing of it. So you, yeah, because they all say, right, that's exactly what they say. They say brown fat is going to get burned out somehow, right? And it's going to... Yeah. So just, br br brown uh, fat is thermogenically active, like it's not, while white fat is mostly for storage of fat. Well, brown fat makes the, makes the fat cells consume themselves, right? To actually metabolize the, the fuel, which is stored within themselves. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, white fat turns into brown fat under the influence of adrenaline. So chronically raising your adrenaline to turn a lot of your white fat into brown fat doesn't sound like a very good thing. I mean, like some of the most successful drugs on, in the history of mankind are adrenaline antagonists. Like the beta blockers, they're all blocking adrenaline. It's like the number one drug for heart disease. Number Now they're finding out it can treat post-traumatic stress disorder. They can treat depression. can treat like uh, nightmares uh, in soldiers. It can treat dementia. It can treat all these things. So adrenaline has a very intimate relationship to the stress system, right? It's part of it. And it's one of the one of the main factors of the stress. So, okay, yes, a little bit, right? But if you if you're chronically stressing you out, you're sending a signal to the entire body that it needs to drop things that are considered luxurious in terms of um, differentiation, like things like higher cognitive function, libido, sexuality, fertility. All these things fly out the window mm -hmm. if you're if you're exposing yourself to stressful or anything more than I'll say 24 hours. I mean, it's really the difference between acute and chronic stress. So yeah, you you'll be in the sauna for three hours, which is uh, it's actually, I don't, I don't want to call it a stress. It's actually beneficial for you. For some people, initially, it's hard to tolerate, but because they don't have the tolerance, right? They need yeah. to work out. Which you slowly build up. Yeah, that's the other exactly. problem is that people are going in but there. But it's beneficial. It's beneficial. Right. While, and then when they when they come out of the sauna, jump into the freaking frigid water for a few seconds, maybe up to half a minute, and then you and you leave, right? It's yeah. that conflict, that, that, that contrast between the two. I think that's another beneficial factor. Mm -hmm. But if you're jumping into the cold water, they're trying to excuse it as being like, oh, it's the same thing as sitting in the sauna, but it's the opposite in temperature. Yeah, yeah but... You can't compare it. Like sitting chronically exposed yourself to very low temperature is yeah. not a good thing. But it it's looks cooler on Instagram, okay? And then now you have the other. Oh yeah, and then now you have those guys like Laird Hamilton, which is like a surfer. I don't know if you know him, but these sort of uh, fellas that uh, go into the sauna and now they put a fucking stationary bike inside and they start doing push-ups in the sauna. And I'm just like, uh, again, that's ridiculous. Can we yeah. just can oh, we yeah. just keep like just stay normal? Like my God, because it just you always gotta fucking take it. 
to the next level with, with these people. And it's, exactly. It's, it's all about taking it. Like, that's a keyword. Taking it to the next level. Sometimes there is no next level. Sometimes you found the optimal thing, mm -hmm. and anything more than that mm -hmm. moves away from the optimality. So the keyword is optimal, not maximal, right? Yep. I mean, it's like it's There's always balance like again maximizing things. It's like yeah. maximizing profit. Well, guess what? Life is about optimizing. It's not about maximizing. Yes. They're back to that kind of being in the center kind of thing, right? It's yeah. like, fuck, man. Because, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, maybe maybe you do a couple push-ups in a sauna just to get, break a sweat if you want extra. But you really should need to do that. And I just, again, I think that is a bit too much on your heart because then your heart was just pounding. I don't know if you ever tried doing that. I mean, oh, yeah. You know, and again, it's just like, like you said, it goes from being good to being like, oh, then more of that must be even better. And must be better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you're like, well, look, if that was the case, then people will be like, uh, you know, putting these backpacks filled with like weights and going and running the Sahara Desert, right? <laughs> but they, they don't do that. Well, maybe I shouldn't give them any ideas. Hey, Next don't, thing don't, you know, don't, don't, there. <laughs> just wait. Netflix will release a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so in those spheres those guys are doing that and then another thing is a lot of you brought it up earlier nad they're all doing these nad pushes and it's becoming another dick measuring contest of uh who can do it the fastest have you have you seen yeah. those guys who are like you know they they, they go from like in uh, having an iv you know for 30 minutes to 20 minutes to now there's guys that are doing it in five minutes and they're feeling nauseous and awful what are your thoughts on nad and all those things nad in what sense Oh, they're they're doing NAD pushes, just straight straight NAD pushes, IVing right into the, the fucking arm. So, so the thing is, like, so the NAD you have to be careful with because there's like there are multiple feedback mechanisms. So if you if you flood too much NAD uh, into the system, sometimes you can down re regulate some of the metabolic enzymes in the glycolysis cycle. So you should be careful. I mean, for example, ATP has an inverse relationship with the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase. Mm -hmm. So if the cell produces too much ATP, it's kind of like a signal for the cell that metabolism is too high, right? So ATP downregulates the one of the key steps for metabolizing glucose, PDH, pyruvate dehydrogenase. Mm -hmm. So the same thing is known to happen with NAD. You raise NAD too much, it's going to raise ATP, and then you're going to actually downregulate metabolism if you flood the system with too much NAD, like in, a, in, in too short of a period. Mm -hmm. I think also NAD, too much of an NAD also inhibits some of the, I think there's like eight or nine enzymes just part, as part of glycolysis. Some of those depend on NAD, but too much NAD can actually inhibit them. And you don't want to mess with the glycolysis. Once you start inhibiting glycolysis, you can actually cause cell death because that's the basic primitive metabolic step that every cell needs to survive. So you, you where are they that. getting this idea? What, what's, their, what's their thought be behind doing an NAD plus IV and thinking that it's going to somehow extend their life and be good, beneficial? Well, all of the studies that Sinclair, the guy from Harvard, David Sinclair, who uh, uh, he, uh, yeah, he yeah, popularized the Australian resveratrol. dude, right? Uh -huh. yeah. Resveratrol, um, yeah. Resveratrol. He actually had a company with, which was selling the special version of resveratrol. Really, it wasn't special at all. It was called Longevinex. Uh -huh. And he sold it to, his company was called Sertris, uh, under the, the name of those genes, the Sertwins. Uh -huh. So he sold his company to Glaxo, to GSK, GlaxoSmithKline. Okay. And they actually started doing clinical trials with his resveratrol. Three people died within the first two weeks. They shut down the whole trials and his company. But he, <laughs> nobody's he hearing got about that. <laughs> yeah, he got a seven hundred million dollar payout. You can look it up. It's on Wikipedia. Type David Sinclair in Google. Look mm -hmm. his Wikipedia page. There's an entire section of how he built up surgeries, built up the hype about resveratrol, right? Mm -hmm. It attracted the attention. Now a lot of the studies about raising NAD are legitimate, right? But resveratrol is really not a good way to do that because it it's actually it's, it's it is itself a potent phytoestrogen. Mm -hmm. uh, it it competes with estrogen for the estrogen receptors and it activates with about the same affinity, with about the same strength. So you are taking a potent estrogen yourself by taking resveratrol. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the most infamous drugs that was ever approved, Vioxx, which killed a, a number of people back in like in the early two thousands, it was subsequently withdrawn. Is a very close structural analog of resveratrol, mm -hmm. and a, a lot of the very powerful NSAIDs, um, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs that Big Pharma is working on, mm -hmm. are based off of Vioxx. More of them are still coming and about to be approved, and resveratrol and those drugs. All share the same structure. It's called a steel bean. All steel beans, they, they exist uh, in nature uniformly. They're widely distributed in nature in almost every plant. They're all estrogenic. They're all phytoestrogens. Mm -hmm. So taking resveratrol will raise um, your, your NAD levels by but speeding we'll also, up glycolysis. Okay. Mm -hmm. by, by speeding up glycolysis, yes. But the glycolysis generates NAD by generating lactic acid. 
So the so you don't want to be speed. Uh, the way to generate NAD properly is by having the NADH, which is the reduced version, uh, properly oxidized to the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Mm -hmm. If resveratrol is only accelerating glycolysis, glycolysis can also generate NAD back from NADH, but it uses pyruvate as an emergency oxidant, and pyruvate oxidizes NADH back to NAD and creates lactic acid. Pyruvate turns into lactic acid. And all estrogens, yes, they can increase your amount of NAD because they help oxidize the NADH back to NAD, but they're doing that by speeding up that cycle of using pyruvate as the emergency oxidant. That's really bad. You're creating the cancer metabolism. Okay, so, 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 not so a smart way of raising your NAD. But what about doing just a straight NAD plus IVs? What's the difference between you NAD? You can do it. You can you do can it. Do it. Mm -hmm. So basically, like they said, oh, if you take NAD as a as a pill, they actually sell NADH as a pill, right? Mm -hmm. So, but but it's the reduced form. And then they tried taking NAD as a pill, and they found out they basically they said, oh, it gets destroyed by the stomach acid. Not much of it gets absorbed. I'm like, really? It's mm -hmm. not much different than NADH. If you have mm -hmm. the NADH as a pill and continue to sell it and don't make any claims that it's getting destroyed and whatnot, it should the NAD should work as well. Yes, it, it tends to be unstable, but it's so is NADH. There's nothing fundamentally different between these two chemicals. Mm -hmm. But of course, they're looking to popularize a type of therapy that looks exclusive, it looks exotic, mm -hmm. it looks expensive, and it can only be done by this special doctor. It's again, it's like the exclusivity club. They're a member right. of a club that you are not a member of. So yes, it works, it probably works better, but there's safer ways like taking the precursor niacinamide or nicotinamide riboside or mm. nicotinamide mononucleotide, which is actually the best precursor of the three. So just um, buying a quality niacinamide and taking some of that will do the same thing. That's it. Maybe that's not it. the same quantity, whatever, but it will Over time, over you will time, actually right? probably exceed. And it's probably safer, it. right? Because you're doing it slower, yeah. which is, again, our ID. It, the, the, the problem with those circles is, again, it's like, oh, you can do it. Okay, let's do it faster. Let's do more Exactly. Of it. Let's do it faster. Yeah. And so you're affecting a lot of. Uh, 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 cyber sort of like uh, negative feedback control mechanisms and the idea that came out of Russian research into cybernetics mm -hmm. and the uh, most famous American scientist who took that idea was Norbert Wiener. Uh, he's the father of American cybernetics and he basically said that nature is filled with these negative feedback mechanisms where basically like uh, when, a, when, a, when multiple steps of a process produce something, the final output is not inert. It has an effect on all the previous steps, one or more, some often all of them, but at least one of the previous steps that actually produced that output, right? So it's always like a like a feedback cycle. Mm -hmm. And and of course, unfortunately, modern medicine is, seems to have forgotten that. So to them, it's like, oh, well, if this works, we're going to give you more, you know, it's going to, if this works, then more should be better. It doesn't work like that. So the yeah. thing is, niacinamide, you, when you take more, it can actually get stored in a, in a long-lived form called uh, one methyl nicotinamide, and as needed, it can get used to replenish the NAD pool if the body feels that it needs it. When you're doing this NAD directly as an IV infusion, you're overloading the system with NAD. But guess what? If it gets too much, it will either inhibit some, some cycles that are really you shouldn't be inhibiting, or the liver will simply get rid of it. I mean, if it thinks there's too much of it, the liver will excrete it. Make no mistake. So no is that how why you think they're getting like nauseous when they're doing it really fast like that and they're just feeling like shit? I think the nausea is mostly from 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 uh, immediate hypoglycemia because if you mm -hmm. raise the NAD to the NAD, to the NADH ratio, you're immediately inhibiting the oxidation of fat and stimulating the oxidation of glucose. The glucose in your body is supplied through two main routes: either diet or glycogen in the liver, right? Mm -hmm. So if you haven't eaten, and I think a lot of these bozos are doing these injections on an empty stomach, you're basically <laughs> immediately ca causing a stress reaction, and because the body's like, oh my god. Uh, so now that the breaks of glucose metabolism have been removed, suddenly the blood, blood, blood glucose drops, which means the body is scrambling to, to, because the body is trying to do everything possible to prevent blood glucose from dropping too low because you can go into a coma. Diabetics right. are very well known to do that. And that's mm -hmm. why they never, they're always careful about how much glucose they eat and how much, how much insulin they inject. You inject too much insulin, you can go into diabetic coma. It's, right, and right. You can die, it happens right? to bodybuilders too. Yeah, man. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think the nausea is one of the primary symptoms of acute hypoglycemia. And when you raise the levels of NAD to uh, the ratio of NAD to the NADH by injecting this tons of NAD plus, right? Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. Potentially causing acute hypoglycemia. If your liver has sufficient glycogen to handle that, the demand for glucose, yes, but many people don't because about a quarter, actually more than that, 35% of the population has NAFLD, non alcoholic fatty liver disease. Mm -hmm. Some people, like about 10%, have the even more severe form, non alcoholic steatohepatitis, NASH. 
Um, and then like a fewer percentages have even like like more severe cases like cirrhosis and whatnot. So before you're done with it, it looks like the majority of the population has some form of liver disease, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it basically like so so many of them don't have enough glycogen to meet the the demands of like well, something and, called yeah. hypoglycemia. And so a lot of those bozos, as you said, they're on on the the cutting edge keto diet. The and keto so diet. that's so the other all, thing. They already don't have glycogen, right? So they're mm. already depleted. See, and it makes what a lot happens, of sense now, man. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't have the glycogen to, to handle the demand, then the emergency mechanism in the body is cortisol. Immediately rises, starts breaking down tissue, and then to convert all these amino acids into glucose mm -hmm. by the liver through the core cycle, basically the, the, the gluconeogenesis. So, so basically, that's really, I think that's what's happening. And if it happens too often, you're actually creating this, this uh, you're setting the system for, for getting used to these, to these stressful reactions. So now when you actually, uh, even when you stop doing the NAD+, you may actually get into a situation where the body can go into a rebound state and, and protectively start to inhibit the metabolism of glucose because it feels like it, don't, it doesn't have enough in store, right? Mm -hmm. So it may actually make you shift you towards fat metabolism because the body's like, oh, wow, I, every once in a while I get these episodes where basically I'm really pushed to oxidize glucose, but it's not available. Mm -hmm. So I need to do something to pr protect me from getting into these states. And what am I going to do? I'm going to upregulate fatty acid oxidation because it puts a break on glucose metabolism. So the next sense. time yeah, when you're giving me the NAD+, plus, instead of putting me into a hypermetabolic state of glucose, it's going to only raise me to normal because I've, I've, I've compensated, I've put the brakes on it by upping fatty acid metabolism. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's, you're, you're not doing a good thing if this is done chronically. You shouldn't be stressing your body constantly by doing these things which are supposedly good for you. Yeah, actually, the NAD infusions, they've been known since like the 60s. And mm -hmm. if you look at the older studies, they were all done through a so-called slow infusion. It's an infusion, not an injection. Mm -hmm. The big difference. So you go to a doctor and you get, an, you get an infusion, you get an IV put on, and you get an infusion of NAD over a period of 24 hours. Not go to your doctor and get injected you know, yeah, they're doing pushes where they're. They, I yeah. don't know what the record is, quote, whatever, but there's guys that do it in under ten minutes, shit like that. You know, and, it's and, ridiculous. And, I, and, I, it, and I, it's I, becoming that's... another one of those, like I said, dick measuring contests where it's just like, okay, I'll do it faster. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> what the fuck do you want? We're not in a rush. Yeah, we're not in a rush. <laughs> I don't know what the rush is. <laughs> oh man, exactly. Who will get healthier faster? I'm like, that's the very notion of yeah. getting healthier faster is already unhealthy. It just sounds so stressful. Exactly, man. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and then another, the other. Th thing that I want to talk to you about is like vitamin D, okay? Because there seems to be a lot of controversy going on with vitamin D. There's the people that say supplement vitamin D3 uh, if you need it, right? If, you're, right. if your score is, uh, I think the, the American currently is 30, 30. is the lower end, 30, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 30. And then there's people that say don't do it because it, it's going to rob you of other stuff and it's actually a magnesium deficiency, not a vitamin D. D3 de uh, deficiency. What are your thoughts on all that stuff? Well, here's the thing. Vitamin D, the, the, uh, I mean, in order for you to synthesize, you need, uh, you need UV light, right? And you also need cholesterol, and you also need magnesium. Mm -hmm. So having low vitamin D levels can be a sign of vitamin D deficiency, but it's not an exclusive sign of it, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, it could be just a sign of low metabolism or lack of exposure to sunlight, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, by all means, you can supplement magnesium, but keep in mind, people usually that have low vitamin D um, it's usually that the overarching symptom is low metabolism because just like cholesterol getting converted to pregnenolone, the first step um, of the metabolism of cholesterol into vitamin D requires ATP as a cofactor. So in other words, if you don't have sufficient vitamin D levels, that's already a pretty irrefutable sign of low metabolism. Okay. And if, if ATP levels are low, if you, if you supplement magnesium, most of it will be wasted. Magnesium can only be absorbed and utilized because in the body, when it forms a complex with ATP, so magnesium never floats freely in the blood. It's always complexed with ATP, and it's distributed uh, to cell to the cells in the form of this free of this ATP complex. There's no free magnesium that somehow gets shuttled to cells. So, so is that why doing like a, a red blood cell count uh, for magnesium would be dumb, or just doesn't make any sense, right? Because you can't really measure it well. Well, well, you can. You, it's better than it's better than doing the serum. So red blood cells is actually measuring the magnesium inside of the yeah, cells. Yeah, serum is like the uh, worst, right? And then serum red is the worst. Uh -huh. Serum doesn't doesn't mean anything, right? It's in fact because magnesium is an intracellular uh, 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 nutrient. 
potassium, magnesium inside the cell, sodium and calcium outside of the cell. Uh -huh. So if you're doing blood tests and showing that potassium and magnesium also in the serum are high, that's actually a pretty bad sign. It means the cells somewhere are dying and spilling their, their internals into the bloodstream. And doctors already recognize there that hyperpotassinemia, uh, in other words, high potassium levels in the blood are very, very dangerous. They can actually stop your heart. The drug for lethal injections that used that's used in most executions in the United States, mm -hmm. it is a potassium pancobromide, I think. Mm -hmm. It basically overloads the heart with potassium, and the heart muscle stops. Yeah, so, so don't, don't take potassium supplements. Don't like potassium, some, exactly. Do that. But also, uh, you know, if you measure magnesium into your blood, some people will say like, "Oh, I have a high rating." That's not a good sign. So it's only tissue magnesium that matters, right? But mm -hmm. in order for the magnesium to be utilized when you take it as a supplement, it needs ATP as part of the transport mechanism. Okay. So if your metabolism is low, ATP will be low. So taking that magnesium probably won't do much for accelerating vitamin D because it depends on ATP, which depends on metabolism, and depends on magnesium. But no low ATP means low conversion of cholesterol into vitamin D and also low utilization of magnesium. So you're not going to help much. I mean, it, yes, technically it is one of the cofactors, but in order for it, for it to be utilized, it's kind of like a catch-22. Metabolism needs to be up to speed. Mm -hmm. So like, okay, so what do I do? Well, raise metabolism. How do I do that? Well, maybe thyroid, maybe eating extra protein, uh, mm -hmm. making sure that the protein is at least one gram per kilogram of body weight, uh, eating extra salt, caffeine, all of these are metabolic stimulants. Mm -hmm. And if once you raise metabolism, then you can take magnesium and see if that will fix your, your vitamin D deficiency. Okay. If it doesn't, then it's not a vitamin D deficiency problem. Uh, and but what I'm saying is that magnesium will only help if your metabolic state is already is already up to speed in a in a normal state. So first, probably first course of action would be to try all those things you're saying, and then try supplementing and, some. And then try magnesium and see if it's going to be a magnesium deficiency. If if the if the vitamin D deficiency gets corrected mm -hmm. after you raise metabolism and took the magnesium and or took the magnesium, then mm -hmm. yes, no need to supplement with, with vitamin D. However, mm -hmm. if none of these things help. Then basically, you know, you you need to take the vitamin D because it's such a broadly protective nutrient. Mm -hmm. It's one of the main differentiating factors in the body. If you have any cancer cell, any can, any cell that has basically already given up on its environment and says, "No, I'm only going to grow and divide," and we have the, those cells all the time. Uh, vitamin D has, is, has been shown to be one of the two or three factors, together with aspirin and progesterone, that are able to force that cell to go back to normal. Right, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I discussed this with Daniel on the latest podcast. There, uh, the, he has two or three studies on on the website. There, they show that basically vitamin D, specifically D3, is a pro differentiating factor. While vitamin, the active vitamin D, which they call calcitriol, mm -hmm. with, in which vitamin D3 metabolizes, that actually is dangerous because it raises PTH. Uh, it raises inflammatory mediators, it raises prolactin, it raises serum calcium. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, and people are saying, well, if I take vitamin D3, that's dangerous because ultimately I'm going to raise calcitriol because it's a metabolite. No, it doesn't work that way. Remember, the feedback mechanisms that I keep coming back to. So if you take vitamin D3, the, the body says, which already has its own vitamin D effects, the body says, oh, I already have enough. I shouldn't produce as much calcitriol. And in fact, it has been shown that if you take vitamin D3, and if your calcitriol levels were high before, they'll actually drop, uh, drop back to normal. The body says, you're giving me an exogenous vitamin D, which has similar effects to the calcitriol that I'm already producing. Mm -hmm. That calcitriol is dangerous. Now that you're giving me the exogenous vitamin D, I don't need to produce as much calcitriol anymore, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, scale back, scale back. And that's if you're taking vitamin D3. And then, yes. you know, when, when you're in, um, like, like a whatever supplement shop, uh, shop, and they have a supplement that just says vitamin D. That's the calcitriol that you're talking about, right? Calcitriol is not sold as a supplement. It's only available as injection, and it's a prescription drug. Mm. So if they're saying vitamin D, I think legally in the United States, they're only allowed to say uh, to sell two forms, D2 and D3. Mm -hmm. Both of those are precursors to calcitriol, right? Mm -hmm. But of the two, the D3 is safer because D3 in the body gets metabolized into D2 and eventually into calcitriol, mm -hmm. but the D2 itself... I think the only reason it's being it's available is because doctors like it because it's actually an approved as a drug. And if you go to a doctor and ask for vitamin prescription for vitamin D, mm -hmm. they will give you a prescription for vitamin D2, 50,000 units taken once weekly. If you ask for a prescription of vitamin D3, they'll tell you, get out of here. It's an over-the-counter thing. I cannot prescribe <laughs> it. Yeah. Okay, so D3 is a better option. You could take it, D2. And the, ones, and the one probably, if, it, if you're buying a vitamin D supplement on the market in the United States, in all likelihood, it will be a D3. If mm -hmm. it's D2, 
Its legal status is a little bit murky because doctors are able to prescribe it. Okay. I don't think it's officially a prescription drug, mm -hmm. but but I think I haven't seen any supplements with D2. Mm -hmm. Now, and calcitriol, which is the final step, the, which medicine calls the active vitamin D, mm -hmm. it's only available by injection and only by prescription. So vitamin D3, and how would you supplement it? How, what would be your course of action? You know, if somebody says gets a blood test and let's say their vitamin D is... Uh, Oh, that's another thing that I wanted before we go there. Uh, the tests, right? Because there's different tests for vitamin D, right? Which one should people get? Which one should people avoid, do you think? Should always test both the 25-hydroxy, uh, which is what basically what vitamin D3 helps raise, mm -hmm. and one 25-hydroxy, which is calcitriol. So okay. basically what you want to see is first test test both of these before you supplement. And in many, in many people with chronic conditions, you will find that the calcitriol is high, Mm -hmm. or the 125 hydroxy is high, while the 25 hydroxy is low. And when you start supplementing, it means the body is like, oh, I need to produce more of the active one for whatever reason, like uh, increased calcium absorption, increased PTH, etc., etc. When your body is under stress, all of these things rise. And then if you start supplementing D3, you will, you should see, or in, in all, most people will see, that D2 levels will rise, mm -hmm. while the levels of 125 hydroxy, which is calcitriol, will drop. And that's what that's the that's the end result you want to see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, okay, so when people are calcium, also serum calcium and serum phosphorus and PTH. So you surely you surely should be doing five tests when you're testing because vitamin D is never never uh, enough on its own. You want to know the, the how the whole system of calcium homeostasis works. Okay, so and break that, those down for us. Yeah, the five tests: calcium, serum calcium, uh, serum phosphorus, parathyroid hormone, mm -hmm. twenty-five hydroxy, which is the the, the vitamin that you want to be high and 125 hydroxy they all affect each other there's there are multiple feedback mechanisms between these five things mm -hmm. so you you test these things before you start taking vitamin d3 and you start taking the vitamin 3 and over time you should be seeing so in a bad situation pth will be high serum calcium will be either at the very top of the range or like even higher than that right mm -hmm. calcitriol will be high of uh, and and vitamin d2 25 hydroxy will be low and what you want to see, an improvement will be, once you start taking the vitamin D3, you will see that PTH drops, calcitriol drops, 25-hydroxy rises, right? And, and serum calcium normalizes as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so what is the, you know, the people that are very anti-taking vitamin D3 and they say that it uh, messes up with your calcium, what's their, what's their process of thinking there? Why do they say that? Well, there's some case studies showing that if you take vitamin D, like large doses, you can get hypercalcemia. Mm -hmm. But basically, I think this is mostly in people that are already in very compromised uh, state, such as they have a hyperlactin, uh, high parathyroid hormone, high estrogen, right? And vitamin, in, in those people, the, the serum calcium was probably already at the top of the normal range. Mm -hmm. So when you take vitamin D3 initially it may stimulate calcium absorption from the intestine to the point where you get you may get like a mild version of hypercalcemia. But it's been shown that vitamin D3 itself does not have the hypercalcemic effect. It's only by metabolizing into that final calcitriol, that's the one that has the, mess, you can mess up with your calcium by raising your serum calcium mm -hmm. above normal levels. But over time, if you manage to drop the calcitriol by supplementing the vitamin D3, your serum calcium levels should go back to normal um, and, and, and basically, it should be a regulating beneficial factor, not a messing up factor when you take vitamin D3. And having enough calcium in your diet helps support all that, right? That's the other thing. If you don't have enough calcium in your diet because the body, all the cells constantly need it, what the cells do is send, send these signals to the parathyroid gland. And basically, the parathyroid gland will start producing parathyroid hormone, which increases the synthesis of calcitriol. Mm -hmm. Calcitriol mm -hmm. increases the absorption of calcium from the intestine. That's one mechanism when the body gets the calcium right from the diet. But if that's not, in, that's not enough, if the parathyroid hormone rises beyond a certain level, it starts to increase prolactin as well. And prolactin provides, supplies your body with calcium, but it takes it from your bones. Mm -hmm. So it's, not, it's really not a good situation. Okay. So you're basically leaching calcium from your bones. It's a very bad situation. And that's usually in a state of calcium deficiency, dietary calcium deficiency. If you're eating enough calcium, most of these um, osteoporotic factors, what I call them, prolactin, PTH, calcitriol, they're, they're kept in control because the body says, I have enough calcium. I don't need it anymore, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. your, your serum calcium will be like, you cannot overabsorb calcium, right? It's the, the the mechanisms for increasing calcium absorption and providing it to the body only happen when you're not providing the calcium through that. 
Mm -hmm. And so that's why kind of milk seems to be the easiest way to get it or dairy products, right? Dairy products, or if you don't tolerate dairy, calcium carbonate is widely available. It's basically mm -hmm. chalk. I mean, you can get some pretty, pretty pure chalk mm -hmm. from a student of quality. Mm -hmm. um, how, much uh, milk, how much milk would that be, you know, to cover, you would think? Would you, do you do the repeat kind of two quarts a day of uh, milk? That, that provides about two grams of calcium, which is plenty for most people. Plenty. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for people in a really bad health, they want to get better, especially people with a cancer, you, uh, you may want to get to like three, four grams. The Maasai tribe in Africa ingests on a daily basis between five and six grams of calcium mm -hmm. because they almost, the entire diet is almost entirely milk and sometimes meat, but mostly milk and dairy products. And, and they don't eat grains. It's mm -hmm. just milk. Mm -hmm. uh, so two grams, I think, is like is plenty for most people. One gram will be the minimum. Anything below one gram daily, and you start triggering those calcium homeostasis factors like yeah. ferritoric hormone, prolactin, calcitriol, and you start getting the dysregulation, the chronic inflammatory state of calcium deficiency. So mm -hmm. one gram, it's not that so difficult. From what I remember, I think it's like maybe 300 milligrams in a cup of milk, somewhere roughly around there. Yes, so three cups of so milk. maybe three to four cups of minimum. milk. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Be before you start activating this, I mean, the other other sources of calcium, like well cooked greens, mm -hmm. have a lot of calcium in them, right? So that's also a source, right? But raw greens are you don't absorb almost anything from those. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention the pufa that they contain. Almost all plants contain pufa because it's a digestive inhibitor, and that's their defense mechanism against herbivores. Mm -hmm. So like all the sal salad eating people out there. Cut down on the salad. It's really like you're not meant to or eat at least cook the salad, right? Cook the salad. Yeah, eat kale soup or something. Yeah, then just having raw kale salads, which also tastes like shit. Stop lying. Stop pretending That's it right. tastes good. <laughs> no, if it wasn't tasting like shit, why the need for all the dressing? Why the need for ranch, <laughs> oh, yeah. cheese, oh, and all these like you know like and uh, all the, how about all the poof and the dressings that they use? Canola oil and sunflower right, oil, right, or right, right, grapeseed right. oil, or god fucking knows. Exactly. Yeah. A lot all, of those all, oils. All, all oils that used to be actually they were all actually developed as industrial sources of diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. So it's like they were never meant to be eaten. It's just at some point the, 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 the agriculture industry said, hmm, okay, well, I guess uh, the oil industry is too big to fight against. They're going to continue selling oil. And now all these oils that we produce, we, we can't use them for fuel. What, what, what can we do with them? <laughs> well, let's sell them, right? Let's create a marketing campaign and sell them as food. Sounds good, yeah. And so just to one more one more thing about D3. Uh, because there was a there was a recent uh, Rogan up episode. He had a doctor on. I forgot. The doctor said he supplements like he supplements ten thousand I, I use every other day or something. Which was which you know to everybody who was listening was like bonkers. Like oh my god, it's so much. Do you think it's dangerous? I mean, those levels do sound kind of excessive. But uh, is there anything? Well, every other day, which means uh, about equivalent to five thousand units daily, right? So and what they usually recommend is five thousand, right? Exactly. Two studies came out recently which showed that the vitamin D RDAs were basically erroneously created based on two studies, I think done in the 60s or 70s, and FDA took those as like the norm, and they turned out to have a statistical error. So mm -hmm. they were basically kind of basing, they were looking at the average intake of vitamin D in the population and trying to correlate that with blood levels, mm -hmm. and they found out that like, if you take 400 IUs daily, which is the RDA for D3, then you can probably maintain, you, you can avoid deficiency. You'll be like at 30 or slightly above. Turns out that they, that those studies have had some kind of a calculation error. I can send you those studies that exposed the error mm -hmm. and said actually it looks like they've they've discounted they've they've undercalculated the daily requirement of vitamin D by a factor of ten. So which means you need about four thousand units in the, especially in the winter when there's like not enough light mm -hmm. to maintain to avoid deficiency. Mm -hmm. So the five thousand units you 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 dare. That's I mean that's probably good for most people to prevent deficiency. Yeah. So, so there's nothing to be scared of of the five thousand units because the original RDA was based on flawed flaw calculations. And sounds like uh, again sort of, but with this guy, it sounds like the same thing is happening in his mind where it's like more is better, more is better. So you know, like you said, just start four thousand, five thousand units a day, and that'll be plenty. And is there a number you, you think people should shoot for on their uh, hydroxy text? For... So the Vitamin D Council, which is like this non-profit organization, which is uh, now coming at odds with Big Pharma because they uh, they say, like Big Pharma says, oh, you're promoting vitamin D, but it's like, uh, first the accusation is, there's no evidence that vitamin D helps for anything. Then the Vitamin D Council, you know, collected all these studies, and then <laughs> Pharma says, oh, well, vitamin D is a powerful drug. It should be regulated. You shouldn't be recommending it to people. Long story short, Vitamin D Council says that they did their own statistical studies across populations of the entire world and said for most people living above the latitude, I think, of like 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, if you're into the temperate climates or even or even higher, two to 3,000 units a day is the norm. That's what you should be shooting for. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, and if you want to, like the, in terms of optimal levels, uh, between 40 and 50 on the American test seems to be optimal. So vitamin D does seem to have a U-turn, like the so, sort of U-shaped curve. In other words, inverted U-shape. Mm-hmm. So as you're starting to raise your vitamin D dosage, the benefit rises, right? You reach like a plateau. And if you keep taking more and more and more, eventually you, you're getting it like a, like, like a detrimental level. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, I think if you start taking too much, then you start increasing the need for, for the other fat-soluble vitamins because they work together with vitamin D, mm-hmm. especially vitamin A and K. Mm-hmm. Um, and most people, yeah, you may be able to get enough A because most foods are fortified with A, mm-hmm. but K, oh, it's so it's so rare in nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, most people are already deficient in K that it's very hard to get like a, a sufficient amount of it. And now if you take too much vitamin D, you've increased the requirements for vitamin K beyond what your meager dietary lifestyle can already provide. Mm-hmm. So if you're taking more than 10,000 units daily, I think it, it, it pays off to take maybe a milligram or two of vitamin K2, MK4. Okay, so um, be moderate they, with it, yeah. or you could get some of those. There's a lot of those that have vitamin D and K2 with it. Yeah, so, exactly. And Thorn, more. the Thorn. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the Thorn one. I like that one too. I use it yeah. too, and it's pretty cheap, and it's not too expensive. Um, yeah, man. Uh, I wanted, And then one last thing. I, like, What about people who, you know, uh, that want to lose some weight, you know, because a lot of people right now, I feel like it's another one of those things that's happening. People want to lose weight, or how, how would you how would you go? How would you recommend people go about it safely? You know, uh, lifting weights is probably the safest way. Being in a sauna is another way. Mm-hmm. Definitely don't ride a bike, especially not at home. Mm-hmm. I mean, ride a bike if it's fun, right? But not for the purpose of losing weight. Like if you if you if you if if the activity is fun, your dopamine will rise and your serotonin will fall, and that removes the break on metabolism. Currently, there are at least three serotonin synthesis inhibition drugs that are in clinical trials for obesity and type 2 diabetes, and they're very successful so far. So they, one, at least one will probably be approved within the next year or so. So which means that it's serotonin, one of the chemicals that keeps you obese, and serotonin's effects on the body are universally anti-metabolic. So keeping things that go against serotonin. Serotonin goes well with routine. Serotonin goes well with stress. Serotonin goes well with all of these bad things that we inherently feel that they're not good for us. Dopamine goes with fun. Dopamine mm-hmm. goes with breaking routine. Dopamine goes with freedom seeking. Dopamine goes with uh, feeling like you're in control of your life, like doing artistic things, right? Exercising freedom. Uh, even if the system around you is, is like seems like it's very controlling and almost fascist, doing these things help to uh, help to lower serotonin and keep dopamine high and keep metabolism high Mm -hmm. now if you want to go the pharmacological route i mean the bodybuilders have already discovered it all the drugs that they use all of the so-called anabolic androgenic steroids turns out that about 80 percent of their effect is actually blockade of cortisol Mm -hmm. so if you do anything that blocks cortisol over time you're likely to lose weight Mm -hmm. it shows you that since cortisol is the primary mediator of stress together with adrenaline most people conversely are becoming fat because of high stress, high chronic mm-hmm. stress. Mm-hmm. And in so, fact, there's actually a special protocol in medicine. It's called CUMS. <laughs> so another funny... Uh, <laughs> Docs and Locks and CUMS on this episode. Docs and Locks and CUMS. <laughs> C-U-M-S. Actually, it's abbreviated this way. And it stands for Chronic Unpredictable Mild Stress. Okay. It is the most reliable protocol in, in animal research to induce both obesity and depression. Mm-hmm. And even neurological disease such as dementia, but then the exposure needs to be much longer. Mm-hmm. But just a few weeks of exposure to comes is enough to start causing obesity <laughs> and, and, and mental health problems. Yeah. And and the comes and they've already com- proved conclusively that the effects of comes are primarily driven by cortisol and serotonin, which shows you, uh, co- corroborates the, what I said earlier, blocking the effects of serotonin and or cortisol and preferably both can actually rapidly lead to weight loss of the good kind. means you're going to lose fat instead of the muscle. So part of the reason why people love getting on testosterone replacement therapy and uh, that's, TRT. That's but I mean, overall, do you think that, that, that's a safe, do you think overall that's a safe practice that people are doing? Or do you think people should look into why they're TRT? I mean, because some, I, I work with some clients that had like, I don't know, below a hundred level, you know, of TR, yeah. testosterone. At that point, you need you need to supplement. Like if you're that level, if you're that hypogonadal, mm-hmm. I think the risks, the, the benefits outweigh the risks because, mm-hmm. and, and also depends on the dosage, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, like uh, the bodybuilders are kind of abusing it. They oh, yeah. Take, well, they're taking, you know, a gram a day. Week, 700 mg, yeah. yeah. So it's 100 milligrams a day. Highly yeah. unphysiological dosage. Yeah. And actually, older studies demonstrated that testosterone stops, like the, the, the anti-catabolic, the anabolic, and the pro- uh, pro mood, the mood improvement effects of testosterone plateau at about 25 milligrams daily. 
And they mm. found out by one of the first orally available testosterone drugs on the market was 17-alpha-methyl testosterone. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's got like different names, but it basically it's available in almost every country. And it comes in tablets of 25 milligrams. That's not by mistake. They found out that beyond that dosage, you're mm. not getting any benefit, um, except potentially for women with breast cancer, mm -hmm. because testosterone is a, is a cortisol receptor antagonist. And in breast cancer, you, you kind of want to eliminate almost any estrogenic effect, right? Mm -hmm. So even though testosterone may convert to estrogen, mm -hmm. if you take a very high dosage, you, you, you will have crowded out the receptors of estrogen. So even if you contribute to the increase of estrogen, you have so much more testosterone in the, in the body that it will prevent the, the estrogen's effects. Yeah. But if you're looking simply for the anti-catabolic weight loss, I mean fat loss, let's you know, because that's what we're looking for here. Mm -hmm. Muscle building, you know, mood improving, pro-cognitive effects of testosterone. Multiple human studies have shown that more than 25 milligrams is not doing you any good. Mm -hmm. And that's only slightly higher than the physiological dosage because uh, a young, healthy, muscular male will probably produce, you know, be around 8 to 10 milligrams up to 12 in some people. Mm -hmm. So 25 milligrams is only two times more than that. The standard dose is 100 milligrams, actually, what they prescribe. That's the that's the starting out dose for most people that I know that get on TRT, you know. But that's a weekly thing. That's a weekly. Right. Oh, uh, so you mean 25 so daily is playing. Exactly. Oh, yeah. so, okay. So, so then 100. So the bodybuilders 100, are doing. Yeah, if they're yeah. doing a shot of 100. Yes. Okay, okay. So 100, uh, and they usually get in the injection with the ester, which is long, like long live, right? So you're right, getting right. once a week so or once every two weeks. Curve. Uh -huh. So the, Exactly. But the bodybuilders are doing six to 700 milligrams weekly, yeah, which that's... comes down to about... <laughs> 100 milligrams daily, right? That's a lot. That's yeah, too much. Yeah. And I'm saying you're not getting anything. Beyond 25 milligrams daily, you're already at like at the peak of what testosterone can do for you. Mm -hmm. And not forget, keep, don't forget that it also can increase estrogen. It is a precursor to estrogen. So keeping it at 25 milligrams is already giving you everything that you can get from testosterone while still keeping the risk of estrogen adjacent relatively low because it's shown that estrogen uh, testosterone only starts to raise estrogen when injected in doses uh, over about 50 milligrams daily. So mm. if you're taking 25 milligrams daily, which are plenty, right, you're getting all the benefits and still keeping the risks like, you mm -hmm. know, pretty low. And if you want to make it even lower, you take like a natural aromatase inhibitor like aspirin or like a nettle or a vitamin oh, E. Oh, so you think even aspirin could work. So you don't even need to take some of those, you yeah. know, anti, as the bodybuilders, you know, they have like, a, I don't even remember the names. There's hundreds of those. Uh, if you don't abuse the dosage, if you're taking a 25 milligrams of testosterone daily, you don't, you don't even need, you don't need anything crazy. You don't need anything. Exactly. You don't even need aspirin. But because testosterone does have the propensity to aromatize in some very, very stressed people, um, if you raise estrogen, it, it increases the risk of blood clotting, and probably aspirin is a good idea for them anyways. But it mm. also will prevent some of the aromatization of testosterone. Mm. But again, keeping it at 25 milligrams, for the vast majority of people, you probably that's you shouldn't be going over because for a number of reasons. No more benefit, only side effects above that dosage, right? Mm -hmm. And at that dosage, because it's close to the physiological one, only two times higher, you're probably not at that much of a risk of estrogen adjacent anyways. And And... As far as other risks, you don't think if, again if you're keeping it that that uh, dose, any other risks you think that are possible? You know, because some people talk that it's bad for the heart, it's bad for the arteries, yada yada. All of them through the aromatization process. Mm -hmm. Basically, multiple studies have confirmed that if you use a non-aromatizable androgen, mm -hmm. all of these effects, side effects on the cardiovascular system disappear. So it's mm -hmm. the estrogenic the estrogenic potential of testosterone that's really responsible for its side effects. Mm -hmm. well, of course, they only manifest at a higher dosage, right? So. If you take a very high dosage of testosterone, then aromatase inhibitor. If you don't want to get the side effects, don't take that high dosage to start with. But mm -hmm. if you're really, really worried, if you're that compromised health-wise, there are non-aromatizable versions, the safest of which is probably dihydrotestosterone, DHT. It mm -hmm. cannot aromatize and is itself actually an aromatase inhibitor. Mm -hmm. So it's probably, and I, I think multiple people have asked Pete, and he said that DHT is by far the safest and the one he prefers the most. I think he, actually he himself ordered something from a, ordered, ordered some DHT from a Chinese company called Purple Panda. Hmm. Um, so he bought some powder. I think the first package never arrived, but he said he eventually got some and he's like, he feels great on it. He prefers it to testosterone. Hmm. Interesting. I haven't heard that. That's cool, man. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, you, you, thank you so so much for being uh, kind with generous with your time. I just want I wanted one thing that I forgot to ask you about the vitamin A, vitamin D three, as we were talking about it, because it slipped my mind, yeah. is about milk, because that's the other kind of thing that people are going back and forth with. Is like you know, because unpasteurized milk has vitamin A added into it, D three added into it, and then you have you know whole milk which doesn't have that. And some people are saying you don't want to uh, fuck around with those. Uh, 
synthetic vitamins, so just go for whole milk all the time. What are your thoughts on, on those added vitamins and the uh, low-fat milks? So if you're getting, like, so the low-fat milks have had most of the vitamins removed, but uh, even the organic types already have the, the vitamins added. There's no escaping it, right? Mm-hmm. So, yes, you can go with whole milk, but it's got a sufficient amount of fat, so it really depends on how much you're drinking. Um, and uh, if you're doing the anti-cortisol therapies that we mentioned, um, I mean, many bodybuilders, I know many bodybuilders who actually bulk up using only whole milk. They mm-hmm. found out that regular that skim milk or the low-fat milk, for some reason, doesn't give them the, the same anabolic effects. I mean, it gives them the, uh, the, the doesn't give them the same anabolic effects. It gives them pro-metabolic effects. They feel the rise of metabolism. They feel the rise of body temperature, but they don't bulk up as well as with whole milk. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Whole milk should still have the vitamins that are naturally there because the cow put them in there, right? Mm-hmm. The, the cow's organism. But if you're doing the uh, like the like the, the ones that have low fat or no fat, I don't think there's any way around uh, consuming those those uh, synthetic vitamins they're already put, put in there by law. So you don't think there's anything dangerous about having low fat milk with added vitamin A, vitamin D3? If so, I've actually emailed some of the vendors, and the vast majority of them claim to use the regular vitamin D3, right? Mm-hmm. And also, the, as, far, as far as vitamin A, they use retinol palmitate, which is the most common ester, and it's probably one of the safest. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think it's a problem. Um, I think the bigger problem is, and some people blame that on the vitamins. Some brands are basically putting things in there like silica. And some mm. of the gums, the emulsifiers, but they're not reporting on the label. And I caught several vendors that actually, because uh, when I asked them directly the question, they started giving me weasel answers. They said, <laughs> like, look, this is, skim, this is skim milk, right? Mm-hmm. Other than the skim milk, and the reason I asked is like, listen, vitamin A and D are fat-soluble vitamins. How are you keeping the vitamins in emulsion in a fat-free liquid? It's not possible. It, it should precipitate at the top. And they said, well... There are other things in there that are keeping it in solution. And I know that. <laughs> but what things? Okay, so knows. what are those other things? Well, we can't mm. tell you. I'm like, are they gums? No comment. Are they emulsifiers? Like, I mean, are, are anti cake So it could be some carrageenan like or gums yeah. or whatever yeah, exactly. in there. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. So not, not, not a danger. Yeah, because some people are really concerned about those added vitamins. If- if those products don't contain these gums, yeah. right? So maybe so find like, a good low-fat yeah. quality milk, which exactly. is again, of course, exactly. easier said than done. But I think it's doable. I mean, you know, in the city here, at least in LA, you can. There's lots of different milks that are. There's organic. a lot of brands, and, and, and there's and ones that are organic that taste like shit, and there's ones that are organic and taste great. So exactly, you know, exactly. It, it so call the vendor if you like a brand. Call the vendor. The ones that are usually they have a good product, they're pretty honest about it. They actually, want to tell you everything about their product. Mm-hmm. The ones that have a crappy product, they're gonna start getting you start you start getting the cold shoulder. They ignore you. They give you these like lawyeries answers. It's like, well, there is a substance that may be there, but we're not required to report it by law because it's under some kind of amount. I'm like, that's not what I asked you. I asked you if it's there, right? <laughs> and if they come back with like, well, legally it's not there. I'm like, that, that didn't ask you legally. <laughs> it's legally or not legally. Physically, is it There's there or not? that litigation thing that we're yeah, back exactly. at it's again. Once start, start, they start lawyering, you know they're hiding something, right? Oh, it's yeah. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, or like we we can't provide you, but we can just say this, and it's like, oh my fucking oh, god, yes, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. Te- technically, we, uh, we can only speak about the legal aspects. I'm like, no. <laughs> as soon as that talk, yeah, just change yeah. brands. Don't even exactly. go. Exactly. This brand. is not the OJ Simpson trial, right? Yeah. It's like, it's like I, I'm not, I didn't ask you directly if you killed your wife or not. I want to know if there's something in the milk or not, right? <laughs> and they're like, nah. and the ones that actually have a good product, they're like, no, there's zero, nothing else, right? Yeah. Of course, they could be lying, but yeah. that actually. In, in California, at least, there's a law which says that if you if they get asked this question, a vendor of a of a food product, mm-hmm. they're required to have, to answer truthfully or yeah. not or not answer you at all. So that's that's what I'm saying. If you start getting the legalese, that's a way for them of not answering you, mm-hmm. but trying to pretend like they're answering you. Yeah. Right. So, but if you're getting a straight answer, it's very rare that this person will directly lie like that in your face because they're very stiff penalties, right? Um, and you already probably you already feel whether this brand is good or not, right? You've tried it and mm-hmm. you want to know more about it, so you call and ask, right? Mm-hmm. So, so if you get it, if you like the brand and its effects, if you call and you get a straight answer on most questions, right? Then you have a reasonable assurance that you know it's a good product. Now, doesn't mean it will not get compromised down the road because many of the successful ones immediately get bought up by larger companies. That's true. Too, and then, man. of course, and they're like, oh, this brand has a cult following. Let's buy it, lower the quality, yeah. keep the same price. And basically, like, make a ton of profit. I think um, that happened with Horizon, not to call them out. Yes. But you know that brand? I used to drink yes, that brand a lot, food. way back when. And then I just, at some point, I noticed a big change of taste in their milk, you know? And I don't know. And and now they got ones that's, like, 
added omega threes in there, of course, and there the brain. You go. There so you go. I just stay away from that one, you know. But um, hopefully, they don't want to sponsor my podcast. So anyway, but <laughs> but well, there's did, plenty of milk here. here. You've mentioned them. They may call you and say, "We want to change your mind. We're going to send you twenty <laughs> cartons of, right. the, of the good product." Yes, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> I'll give it a yeah, shot. So yes. far, so good in California. I mean. We got a big homelessness problem, but we, we have some milk here. So at least we got some milk here, right? I now. thought it was San Francisco that only had, like, the, oh, really the bad problem. Oh, brother, it's awful oh, in LA, LA, too. Oh, <laughs> LA is fucked up. Are you kidding me, man? Oh, it's it's awful. But is it only the downtown, or is it the LA County as well? Well, it used to be downtown when I moved here back in 2009. Okay. Like, you know, in order to see, like, some scary shit, like to, you know, see dudes sitting on a sidewalk, you know, taking injections, you know, of heroin or whatever, you had yeah. to go to downtown. Like, you okay. had to you had to go to that area. Skid Row was very famous you probably heard yeah, of that yeah, yeah. um now you can see that everywhere man all around you know yeah. i mean of course they still clear them out out of places like beverly hills and really nice places but like i said 10 years ago where there were places where you, there was no homelessness now they're there and also there's this crazy new laws where they have they allow them to you can basically be i think it's 10 feet away from a business and if you're 10 feet away and you have a you know you set up a tent you're fine like they can't leave really it. yeah but that destroys the business the bi- well right right, right. So that's business, what's happening right? so you yeah. have these like doctors literally there's pictures of, there's some accounts i follow on instagram there's pictures of like you know doctors offices and right in front of them there's homeless tents sitting out in front of them and they can't do legally anything about it because they're 10 feet away from the business so because they're on public public land right and it's not it's not your office technically so you're like yeah, yeah but it's affecting my office well you know tough it, titties. it's like, weird <laughs> man i mean you know it, you know people get you know want to argue about it and you know they'll, t- they'll they'll say stuff like well what do you want to do just kill them all and it's like well, it's not what i'm saying but at least it's but we can't tell it, we can't ignore it, right? It's clearly yeah, not getting any but, better. And at least yeah. exactly. That's that's where I'm at. Where it's like at least since I've been here and I've been here for ten years, so I'm sort of, you know, a Los Angelino at this point. Um, it's like I see it's not getting better. So if it's not right. getting better, why are we doing the same shit? Yeah, over? exactly. The insanity, right? It's let's like we're ignoring different. it. Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying you'll fix it in a day, but let's try something different. But they just keep doing the same thing, that you know, more shelters or more whatever, and it's like I see it's not working, you know, so it's like, yeah. I don't know. Whatever you've been doing over the last 10, 20 years, it's clearly not working. Yeah. So we might try, we, we might as well try something new. Doesn't guarantee it's going to work, but look, we've already proven more or less that this doesn't work. Exactly. So you got to try something else. What else, do, what, what other choice do you have? Well, believe it or not, that's, you know, and then people will go back, well, okay, let's build, let's build more shelters again. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> I mean, that's I, how the I conversation bet you goes. So, some company, construction company, is lobbying for that solution, oh. right? <laughs> they go to city council and say, yeah, "Oh, you... propose this solution to the population because you know you can give us the contracts. We're going to build all these shelters. You just you look good up to a the huge owners, of right? Worms. But yep. of course, it solves nothing. We just create these literally institutionalized homelessness." They're actually technically not homeless because they're living in the shelters, but mm-hmm. they're actually institutionally homeless because these people will never have a like an idea of what it means to be in a home, right? Yeah. They yeah. all grew up on the street, and you just move them. It's almost like the mental uh, as- asylums back in like the the 20th century, up until yep. like the I think the the late 80s when there was yeah, this like was federal law which said open them up and like get these people out because they're not getting any better. Yeah. A sane person. If you lock them up in an asylum, they will lose their mind, right? Yep. So it's like we know that when this is not helping. So that they should look at what happened with the mental health care industry mm-hmm. and say, well, it's clearly when you collect a lot of crazy people in the same place, mm-hmm. they're not affecting each other in a good way, right? Exactly. So we need to get them out, right? Same thing with homelessness. You cluster them all together. The only thing you're asking for is more drugs, more crime, and and like and, and you know more desperation because all they see around them is other people in a similarly fucked up state. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the prob- and then these shelters, you know, it's it's the idea is good because right, you helping people out. I I support that. I want to help people out. Hey, but then the problem is that uh, they have rules at these shelters. Like you ke- you right. you have to come in by eight o'clock or nine o'clock. Right. You you can't be past that time, and you can't use drugs in here. And they all right. just go fuck you. So <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So it's like I'm gonna stay on the street. Yeah, I'm yeah. Gonna it's again this disconnect yeah. where you know people just take a side and they put their foot down and they don't want to chat because, like I said, I understand the other side of like let's help people out. But a, a lot of these rules, a lot of these like decisions are being made by people who grew up in the fucking richest area of California. They know nothing about being homeless. They never of had course. any experience with it. They don't have any relative that was homeless or something. You know what I mean? Like they, they read they, about it in a book and they think they have an answer. Yeah, they probably never even met like an alcoholic you know what i mean right, what I'm saying? Right, right, and they're yeah. just making these decisions and it's like well you, you should you should get around these people you know just to see where they're at you know and chat with them and 
So armchair warriors who went to a school and probably got a degree in like criminal justice or oh, like yeah. public health policy. Oh, that, that's the biggest and, one. And they think it's like, yeah, they're like, oh my God, in my book here that I read, like that's already out of print, it says that we should build more shelters. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, life, you cannot read about life in a book. Every once in a while, you got to get out, you know? Yeah. You have to get out more and meet people, and it's ugly, right? But you're not going to solve a problem by simply analyzing the situation over and over again. Yeah, that's where we're headed at, though, sadly. I mean, I hope it'll turn around. I think, like you said, you will, you will, you will, but it'll take some up. kind of cataclysm. It'll take something like, you know, I guess, like at some point, the, the homeless popul population will grow to a point will be impossible to ignore, and you cannot put them all in, in homeless shelters. So the only two things, I mean, either California will try to like ship them out to like other states, mm -hmm. but most states around California are fairly like anti homelessness. Like mm -hmm. they, I mean, they have like anti loitering laws, like Nevada, Arizona, like New fun. Mexico. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're gonna, they're not gonna take the, those the, these hot potatoes on their own land. They're gonna like. Screw that. We're not doing this, yeah, right? Yeah. So California will be, be like, they either have to somehow, well, to use a, a like, a, hopefully it doesn't get to that point, they'll find a way to get rid of them, literally, right? Mm -hmm. Or they'll have to learn to change their lives for the better and incorporate them into society. Mm -hmm. And it takes time. It's not the easy solution, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the only long-term solution. Everything else is shifting the problem to somebody else or yes. turning into a fascist country and killing them all. Mm -hmm. there, and that... that it always seems to be between these two options. I'm like, no, there's a third option. It costs. <laughs> it actually doesn't cost more in in in, time, in in terms of money. It costs more in terms of time because it takes time to turn things around. Mm -hmm. But that's the one option that nobody wants to talk about. It's like either oh, more shelters, like we give them more money or something. No, you you're feeding their problem, right? They're gonna use the money for drugs and whatnot. Or well, these people are complete loss. We mm -hmm. might as well get rid of. Them. Mm -hmm. So it's like only these two voices that I'm hearing, and never the voices of like well. Uh, there is a third option. Yeah, man. And that's what I'm saying. It was like that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, and it just got, and I've had friends that, that were born and raised here, you know, and they said yeah. it's right now, it's peak, it's the worst it's ever been. But like you said, I mean, I, I'm also hopeful. I think, uh, I think people, because like you said, people that I've never, you know, were, were not interested in that sort of stuff before, they just ignored it because they lived in Beverly Hills and had all their money. Now, at least maybe they're a little bit more aware of it, more aware of it, and they're around it, and maybe they'll start thinking about some new ideas. And I think, I think things will turn around, and uh... we need new blood. Like some some of these old timers that are there, that basically like yeah, think they know it all. They yeah, just need man. to get out of there and, yeah. and let let the let the let the different people think about it, right? Yeah. And like, uh, yeah, they may be more inexperienced, but guess what? They grew up there during different times, and every once in a while, you need new blood. Mm -hmm. Like when you become an entrenched insider, you start only seeing like the things that you've seen your whole life and ignore everything else, right? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, a complete outsider, they may be too disruptive, right? But Guess what? I've never seen a situation uh, fixed after 50 years of an insider being involved, suddenly somehow finds a solution. No, actually, it's always when an outsider comes in, brings in some new ideas, some new blood, shakes things up. Yes, maybe in tandem with the insider, but it's never the insider alone who resolves anybody's problem. They usually, at some point, they start propagating the problem because it somehow benefits them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we're hopeful, man. <laughs> I love so it. So am I. Yeah. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on. This was a pleasure, man. Thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm. uh, where can people find you? Uh, I mean, I have a blog. I, I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, my online alias is Heydut, H-A-I-D-U-T. Mm -hmm. So basically the blog is .me. Mm -hmm. Um And I also have a Twitter, which is twitter.com slash Heydut. Whatever I post on the blog, it's set up in a way that immediately like a, like a little summary, an excerpt and tags mm -hmm. are posted on Twitter as well. So you can either follow the blog or follow the Twitter. They largely mimic each other. And I also post on a forum called repeatforum.com. Mm -hmm. that, that's where I usually engage in a discussion with other people. Twitter and the blog are mostly for posts. It's, it's like a diary, right? Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. a, it's like a timeline of, of the things that I'm working on and reading about. Mm -hmm. I don't engage in people there. I found that the Twitter crowd is largely difficult to interact with. The yeah, it's people, people that want like that arguments. fucking quick shot, like, hey, yeah. let me tell you here, like, you know, milk is bad or milk is good. Yeah, exactly, it's just like, exactly. I'm a smart ass because I fucking know it. Yeah, I'm not a fan and, of And Twitter. also Twitter is a short message platform. It's really not meant for like extensive discussions. So yeah. those discussions are try to have on the forum, right? Uh, and I also have a company that sells like these products uh, called idealabsdc.com. Idea Labs is like labs for ideas. Mm -hmm. And then DC because I'm in DC right now. So idealabsdc.com. Um, and that's about it. And I'll send you the uh, the studies. You can share them with people that want to see them. Be yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And, and I'll link all the stuff up so people will get out there. So uh, thank you again, man. Appreciate it. Uh, End up owning me.